Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 115 being recorded on April 4, 2024. I'm joined on Twitch where we do these things live. Twitch.tv slash Socialism S4A is the address by 48 viewers and growing rapidly. I was about to say 47, then it ticked up one. Um, we're doing okay today. Uh, haven't done a stream in a couple of weeks. I think you, you know, trying to keep these to uh, every other week, I think that's realistic. I've been trying to tinker with that since we started doing these two years ago, as I was just telling the chat, uh, even trying to figure out, you know, how many articles to pull. It's always a bit of a guessing game. But, uh, you know, we do what we can, we muddle through, and uh, they seem to work out okay, in large part thanks to uh, the many great chat regulars that show up here uh, week after week, month after month, year after year now. Um, helping to make the chat what it is. I want to thank the mods also. I saw Health Revolt here for keeping things moderate in the chat. And I just want to remind everybody who is here live, uh, don't feed the troll, tag a mod, and I'll make a post about this and pin it. All right, so what do we have coming up in the show today? Let's see, I've pulled some stuff about COVID. As usual, we'll do a COVID check-in. Um, have some stuff about actually smartphones and how when the iPhone was released, anxiety went up dramatically, <laughs> like all, all else being equal, uh, that alone seemed to create a lot of anxiety among users of smartphones. Also going to read an article about the phenomenon known as doom spending, which is when people don't have money, but they're just spending money anyway. There seems to be a lot of that going on in the U.S. right now. Um, they're saying that the U.S. isn't in recession, even though a lot of the data is conflicting. You know, is the economy expanding? Is it contracting? Well, we do know that people are running out of money and they're buying more stuff on credit. Uh, consumer credit spiked recently to an all-time high, as we covered a few streams back. And what's driving this, this kind of doom spending thing? So we'll read an article about that. Um, some other stuff about the economy I want to cover. Is the Fed going to cut rates? Are they not going to cut rates? Um, they've not really said that they are definitely going to cut rates or when they're going to do it. But the market, by which I just mean, you know, mostly old rich people, um, they're demanding that the Fed cut rates because basically at 1% interest, any business model is viable. And that's how we've had this kind of massive um, you know, apparent growth in the economy for the last decade or so. That's how they got us out of the 2008 slump was by basically just loaning money out at, you know, zero to 1% interest. But now that they're raising rates, um, a lot of businesses that need that funding are feeling the heat and they can't necessarily qualify to renew their credit. And there's a looming, as they say, corporate debt wall in the U.S., in the EU. It's actually going to hit in the EU first, but there's a ton of corporate debt maturing this year and especially next year and the uh, 2026 that it's really doubtful what's going to happen as far as whether a lot of these businesses that had been staying afloat on cheap credit are going to be able to stay afloat. And when they don't, that means people thrown out of work. That means recession, which on the bright side means prices come down. But it's, uh, you know, sort of a, a hollow victory because uh, it's another violent contraction of capitalism, as we're talking about in the audiobook series that we're doing right now. Um, not the anti Browderism thing. Since Browder had some really good, before he went revisionist in World War II, um, he had some really good pieces on fascism. And so while we were talking about fascism, I decided to do at uh, someone's recommendation. Uh, Fascism and Social Revolution by R.P. Dutt. Actually, two people were suggesting, uh, not that specific reading, but one, one person was saying you should do some Dutt. Somebody else was like, this goes really well with uh, Fascism and Social Revolution. I was like, all right, I'll do it. It's a long book, but while we're talking about fascism, I'm doing that, and we're going to come back to the anti-Browderism playlist. But the thing on fascism, chapter one that I just posted two days ago, um, that went into detail about what capitalism does in imperialism <clears throat> as far as the boom bust cycle it's no longer just you know as they say the 10-year cycle of ups and downs it starts getting really more violent um, in terms of big crashes and that's exactly what we've seen 
as far as um, if you look at uh, I like to show the housing price chart and we have a housing price chart that is corrected for inflation which you know gives you kind of a, a standard look at this this is as I mentioned from another channel that does kind of real estate market watch stuff reventure consulting um, usually a pretty good channel they started doing some kind of uh, right-wing reactionary scare stuff about squatters recently I left them a comment telling them you know I know you're better than this uh, don't don't start turning your channel into like you know panic about immigrants and squatters and whatever you know crime waves that the right wing talks about but anyway housing market there it is the 130 year average back to 1890 corrected for inflation and what do we see these gigantic price fluctuations there was um, relative stability for a while um, and it's gotten completely out of control these big spikes uh, increasing you know the 70s into the 80s you get a big spike and then again in the 90s and then of course the mid 2000s bubble that popped and caused the great financial crisis all of the other things that were tied up in that the mortgage-backed securities and everything that was related to the housing market and then the eventual credit crunch where nobody could get any money lent to them and we're right back in the same situation again now it still looks like prices are going up in some areas even though it's showing that overall it's starting to go down there are areas regions where the prices are still going up in housing and everything else there's also some regions like texas where there was a ton of new construction also florida some other markets where the price is starting to drop so the way i look at it is like this you have a roller coaster and there's that first hill usually that a roller coaster climbs and the roller coaster isn't just one car it's a whole train of cars so as you go up slowly on that first hill before it really starts zooming around the track what happens is while the front cars are going over the front of the hill and they're facing downward the rear cars on the roller coaster are still facing up so it'll take a little while and the front cars really do have to get down quite a ways before the rear cars are all facing down too. So right now things are facing in different directions. You know, last year or so, um, everything was going up. You know, it was just climbing that hill. It hadn't reached the top and nothing had gone over and was starting to crash yet. But now you've got kind of half and half. The front cars are facing down. The middle cars are level and the rear cars are still going up. So you, some people get confused about this. These things happen kind of slowly at first once they get going. I mean, as you can see, the um, like in 08, when it comes down, it tends to come down pretty pretty quickly. And that's what I would expect this time. You know, people who say that um, prices just never come down, that's not really how capitalism works. It, things work in cycles. But anyway, um, where I was going with this is uh, talking about the economy. Let me get back on the main screen. We're going to do some more articles about is the Fed cutting rates and are they going back to quantitative easing? They've been trying to do quantitative tightening, getting some of the money out of the system and getting some things off of the Fed's, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. It seems like, well, they announced a drawdown taper coming soon. That was just two weeks ago. So are we facing another banking crisis? I think it's very likely. Um, a lot of other channels I watch that do kind of investment stuff are talking about the stock market in kind of a melt up right now, uh, market being careless and people are just throwing money into it, acting like this is going to last forever, uh, really probably isn't. So the next section of things, I started seeing a lot of videos and stories about France making preparations for actual direct war with Russia. So we're going to look at a few things related to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and that whole um, conflict between the two imperialist blocs, the older NATO bloc and the rising BRICS imperialist bloc. Um, you know, I know a lot of people might have sympathies towards what seems like the underdogs that don't have such a track record of being so incredibly horrific like NATO, you know, the US, UK, France that have many hundreds of years of colonial history and all of that. Uh, but capitalism is capitalism. We're not Marxists if we start denying that. 
and you know give them time china russia as long as they let capitalism guide their economy they're going to do the exact same thing and then of course you know brazil india the other um interests that are in and aligned with the BRICS bloc countries that have china as their top trade partner etc so um you know as that comes up what we're seeing is in west africa for example the U.S. and France have for a while, we covered this uh, a while back in the streams, France and the U.S. had um, been putting, quote, anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism troops there to keep down the Islamic militants, which to me, every time I read Islamic State, my brain literally, if you've ever seen um, Mr. Robot, the TV show, where every time he sees E-Corp, his brain just turns it into Evil Corp, like when people say E-Corp. He just hears it as Evil Corp. Every time I see Islamic State, my brain just changes it into the letters USA, literally. Um, I think that that's basically, these things are assets of the United States because it's just so convenient that this destabilizing force goes in and um, starts to tear apart politically any region that the U.S. might want to get a foothold in. And then the U.S. and its allies like France can send in the troops. France, of course, has a colonial legacy in North Africa. And so France and the U.S. have been there. Those countries, though, recently in 2023 have been kicking out France and the U.S. in favor of Russia. So you get the redivision of the world, which is one of the features of imperialism. There's not a social revolution going on. There's not a change in the mode of production. It is just redivision of the world among advanced capitalist powers. So that's what's going on there. And we'll take a look at some stories related to France uh, possibly putting like boots on the ground in Ukraine and some related things. Also have some stories about Israel that we can cover. It's really hard to keep current with Israel. I feel like you blink, you miss 19 new stories about atrocities that Israel is committing. But we'll look at some stuff. It's probably a little bit older. But um, this is one of those situations where stories do fall through the cracks because so much is coming at you. And maybe, you know, we can share some stuff that maybe uh, slip by some people before. And then finally, as kind of a feature, um, we have that Henry Kissinger story from the Red Spectre, the man, the myth, the war criminal. I'd been wanting to get to that for a few streams, making that a priority today. And I think that's probably all that we can get to. Uh, before we get to anything else, like checking in with the chat, let's go ahead and thank the patrons. Uh, it still has March up there because it takes Patreon a few days to kind of or like a week to kind of do all the billing and update the names. But thanks to everyone supporting at patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. Uh, Patreon is better for recurrent payments. Buy me a coffee. You can either do a one time, you know, kick in five, 10, 20 bucks, whatever. Um, or you can actually do a membership on buy me a coffee as well. But patreon.com slash socialism for all and buy me a coffee.com slash socialism for all. Really appreciate that support. This is a non-commercial channel. It is viewer supported, you know, just like PBS except communist. So uh, really, really appreciate that. I wouldn't be able to spend nearly that much time, as much time as I do researching this. For every hour of content that goes up on the channel, there is somewhere between two to four hours, depending on what kind of content it is, uh, of behind the scenes work. So it's a lot, a lot of hours. I do upload pretty regularly, at least two or three times a week, most weeks. And, um, you know, I try to bring the highest quality content that we can do that involves talking to a lot of people, suggesting stories, looking through them, trying to group them together and, you know, bring you more of a, a narrative or a group of stories uh, that might, you know, suggest something rather than trying to take things in isolation. I don't usually think that that's really a good approach, but it does take time. Um, so actually, just to give you a look inside the books, um, we've been pulling about 1200 a month for the last six months or so. And if I do 20 hour or $20 an hour, that gets you, um, well, you know, there's taxes and stuff like that, but somewhere between, let's say like, well, around 50 hours. So um, the more we get, the more hours I can put into this. I'm roughly getting paid like a quarter of full-time pay for this. So the more donations, the more time I can spend. Uh, you know, if there's 22 working days in a month, I can spend, um, 
you know, about two to three hours a day on it, Monday through Friday. So, of course, it doesn't really work like that. You know, there will be times where I need to take three days away from even looking at it. And then there's other times where there's momentum, but kind of averaging it out. That's what we get. But really appreciate the support. Keep it coming and I will keep the content coming. That is my promise to you. Uh, and speaking of, you know, just work going into the channel, the other day I had kind of more of an admin day and uh, yeah, doing some new logo stuff there. Looks kind of shitty when you <laughs> zoom in that close. I got to kind of keep uh, working on the uh, the graphics, but decided that this is what comes out in when I do the S4A live streams. I'm using that font and uh, I needed a color that would stand out against really kind of any background and came up with this this color which actually kind of like uh you know as far as you know eco-socialist and whatnot i think it's it's a nice contrast and i dig it so um starting to update the thumbnails somebody else suggested they're like hey you should do thumbnails and i was like you know i've never really thought about doing thumbnails um i always think of this channel as kind of like low budget as far as um I mean, even let's face it, low effort as far as the visuals go. Uh, I'm much more interested in kind of the the content, you know, the quality of what's actually being said rather than the production value per se. Obviously meeting a sort of uh, bare minimum with that. But I was like, uh, let me try the thumbnails out. We got some kind of interesting, uh, give you an example if you haven't seen them yet. Some of the thumbs. Yeah, okay, so there's an example. I was like, uh, okay, I'll do a, uh, a thumbnail for this little blurb about what is social murder angles. Um, I think it was from the conditions of the working class in England. And yeah, threw together a little thumbnail there. Uh, this one was cathartic for me personally. And I was like, you know, I kind of like doing thumbnails, actually. It's a bit more effort. But if you do it right, uh, it's really satisfying and kind of fun. So yeah, um, thumbnails. And as you can see down in the lower left corner, I started putting a logo. So you know, it only took me four years to kind of start uh, standardizing the visual appearance more. Now I will say, um, as far as the thumbnails on the audiobooks, I started tinkering with that too. I'm a little bit torn, to be quite honest. Uh, I'll show you an example of one of the... Uh, the new thumb. So this is uh, Stalin, two camps. So what I used to have is the portrait on the right side, the text on the left, and no logo. In a way, I kind of like that because, you know, I'm just a guy. Like, I'm just doing this thing, and I'm really trying to have the work stand on its own. Um, that said, there's so many crappy other, you know, fakers out there doing this. Uh, for people who like the thing, it might be good, you know, just an eye-catching thing. Oh, that's an S4A video, not some fucking, you know, Duganist fucking fascist uh, pretending to be a Marxist or something like that. So trying this out for a while, we'll see. I actually, after I uploaded these, YouTube puts um, the time of that, like the duration of the video in the lower right corner. I actually have to shrink up the text a little bit because uh, the YouTube like duration is covering up the name so anyway, I gotta kind of bump it up a little bit to compensate for that. So it looks weirder if you look at it in isolation, but it'll look better actually in practice on YouTube. So kind of messing around with that. And I was like, you know, making thumbnails isn't that bad. Sometimes I try stuff on the channel and I'm like, no way am I doing this on a regular basis. It's too much work for not enough reward. The thumbnails I actually kind of like, so hey. And now we have more of a logo rather than just the flag. I guess I've earned it after doing this for a uh, four years. That's, that's the way I'll put it. Got a little bit of a, you know, personality of the channel now. It's taken a while to, you know, when I started this, it was very humble and it was just like, um, why don't, uh, I just start doing some reading, see what's going on in this online communist space, which I really hadn't been watching videos from or anything like that. And it's kind of like my jaw hit the floor when I saw all of the, uh, revisionist and Nazbol stuff. I mean, the Nazbol stuff, kind of like the LaRouche right-winger, just basically fascists pretending to be Marxist, the Caleb Maupin and all that kind of stuff. I was like amazed by that, and I figured that out by the end of the first year. Uh, it took me longer to get into actual anti-revisionist content as far as like what's going on with China and then the various parties that uphold China today. Um, and I do think China is a confusing situation um, in that, I mean, they are 
in the strictest sense, arguably socialist. They didn't have a full-on political counter-revolution where the Communist Party was dismantled per se, but also they have slipped so far back into allowing huge amounts of capitalism that it one wonders just like how much time it, it's actually going to be before you know that final blow happens. That said, there are still vestiges of socialism in China, you know, various, um, just the way that they do things there that can be somewhat confusing to people. Uh, but again, I think it's a question of you've been allowing this much capitalism for, you know, almost 50 years. Um, where is that going to land you in another 10 or 20 years now that you are the biggest economy in the world by PPP? Uh, and, you know, so as that capitalist behavior starts to guide more and more of the needs and interests, um, you know, all you ever hear about with China now is like development, development, development. It's not really how socialism works. You know, I mean, it is how imperialism works. You export capital, you make investments in other countries so as to facilitate the exploitation of those countries. And people are like, no, they're helping them develop. And it's like, I mean, every empire to some extent does development. You have to build roads and canals and all that stuff so that you can set up your businesses and extract, you know, profit from those countries. You can't do that if they have no infrastructure, if the people aren't educated at all. But, you know, what we're really interested in here as socialists is um, which class is in command. And, you know, people debate that. But anyway, so that's why it took more years to come to a more of a skeptical stance about I couldn't really ever get any of my questions about China answered in a clear way, uh, except by people who were more skeptical of China. And so, um, you know, as far as people who, who sort of defend China's capitalist roadism, um, do a fucking better job if you, you know, want people to be more convinced by it, because I don't uh, I don't think it's very uh, convincing once you once you really get into it. But anyway, you know, it's been years and uh, now I kind of have like you know, four years in after four years of kind of bumbling around, I uh, feel like I've kind of figured out what it is we're doing here. So we're focusing on Marxist fundamentals and also anti-revisionist playlist, you know, kind of curricula, I guess you could say. And then we also do these streams to do current events and just chat with people about what's on your mind today. What questions do you have? And with that said, let's get into the chat. That was like a pretty natural segue right there. All right, 49 viewers. Let me scroll up to the top here. We'll catch up with the chat, see what's on people's minds today. Hey, comrades. Yes, welcome, everybody. I see a Lenin and Gorky link. The intellectual forces of the workers and peasants are growing and gaining strength in the struggle to overthrow the bourgeoisie and its henchmen, the intellectual lackeys of capital, who imagine that they are the brains of the nation. Actually, they are not the brains, but the shit of the nation. Yeah. You know, um, I mentioned this in, in another stream, a topic that is of particular interest to me right now. We're doing stuff on the popular front. Probably come back to that at some point. I've been looking more at the NEP, actually. Uh, speaking of China, you know, they're try always trying to say that, uh, oh, what they're doing is like the NEP. No, the NEP was like for less than a decade. And even then... It stirred up hugely reactionary forces that if you read what Lenin was saying about the NEP when he was planning and implementing it, he thought they would just kind of run the NEP and it would run its course and then eventually they would sort of appropriate and socialize these businesses and it would be kind of not a huge deal. And then in reality, within a decade, the petty bourgeoisie, the netmen that were um, empowered under the NEP, became this driving force of counter-revolution that the Bolsheviks had to, like, kind of wage a second wave of the revolutionary struggle against. And it kind of turned the party into um, something it wasn't previously. The party, uh, the CPSU, had, uh, you know, certain kinds of norms and standards within it. This question of what to do about, you know, the kulaks and all of the kind of small business people that were really, really counter-revolutionary. What do we do about them? Stalin had one plan, and then everybody that had, which may or may not have been the best possible plan in the universe, but it's what, 
you know, it was the best that anybody could come up with because all the other opposition within the Bolsheviks wound up being on the right of that. There were some attempts at a left opposition to, you know, where to go uh, in the late 20s into the 30s, and it never really fully cohered. Trotsky tried to do some things, but um, it didn't really cohere. And, you know, the party had to pick up a lot of the slack because the NEP had suppressed the proletariat in some ways. And there were some really unsavory changes. I mean, they went on to build socialism, but I think at a, a big cost. This is um, uh, definitely a thing that after we get through some other things, I definitely want to uh, sink my teeth into more as far as what was going on. The debate about the petty bourgeoisie. Um, in the 1920s in Russia and how that affected uh, outcomes in the 1930s, which includes all of the kind of mid to late 30s, quote, Stalinism stuff, the purges and so on, which everybody criticizes. And I also criticize, I think that there were some very regrettable things there. It also seems to me like the situation was not, I mean, they managed to keep building socialism. Socially, it seemed like the party was overreacting to certain things and... Uh, but I'm not sure that it really was in good control as a result of the protracted struggle that they were in. Um, so I, I, you know, I personally do think some things are regrettable about those years, but, and it may have laid some of the groundwork for Khrushchev later on, but I'm not sure anybody else could have done anything differently. I was just discussing this with somebody else and, um, you know, this is one of these events in history, rather than just being like, oh, Stalin's such a bad person, evil dictator, animal farm, uh, you know, socialism pretends to be liberating, but it's actually tyrannical. I think you're talking about capitalism, because that's, that's what capitalism does. Um, you know, I'm not sure that this was such an issue of ideology, but just that there wasn't the kind of mass base that was needed to sustain the revolution through all of that. And... Um, you know, this may have had less to do with ideology or leadership or anything else and more with just a situation that dramatically um, escalated beyond any reasonable predictions that the Bolsheviks had made. And um, anyway, definitely looking forward to getting into that. Speaking of, um, as far as what's coming up, like I said, we're doing this uh, book by R.P. Dutt, Fascism and Social Revolution. I also have another mystery text that will be a surprise when I do it related to fascism. We'll get back to the anti-Browderism playlist, finish that up. I have a couple of odds and ends. Then we're going to do the last of the basic MO playlist, Anti-During Part 2, Capital Volume 1, Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism, and uh, we'll go from there. I did also, actually, you know, when the Palestine thing came up, I started doing a lot of stuff related to that. And I really lost the thread on where we were, but there's also readings from the housing industry, or sorry, let me say that, homeless industrial complex, we will come back to. Also, I had start, just started reading Lavender and Red by Leslie Feinberg, which is kind of like where the history of the LGBTQ plus movement and the socialist movement, you know, proletarian LGBTQ plus movement um, kind of intersects. And there's a ton more on that. But it was like, just as I was starting to get in that, the, all hell broke loose with Israel's genocide. And I started doing a lot of readings to kind of catch up with that. Um, you know, and people are always suggesting readings. A lot of the suggestions are good, but I am one guy getting, you know, like a thousand bucks a month to do this. There's just only so many hours in the day. And like I said, you know, books are long. A lot of the time I try to uh, be as judicious as I can about, trying to judge what to read first and how to use the time that I have economically and like make the most of it. It's really tough though, because sometimes there are good books that are just super long and, you know, it takes months to get through it um, because I just don't have the time to spend on it. You know, I spend as much time as I can, as we were just talking about in the thanks to the patron segment, but you know, I do what I can. If you'd like to see me, you know, be able to spend more like four or five hours a day, uh, you know, like workday equivalents on this, keep those donations coming. Uh, it really, really does matter and make a difference. So, okay. Thank you, John, for that comment that spurred all of this other stuff, apparently that was, uh, you know, on the tip of my tongue here. Welcome to everybody else tuning in from work. Always good to see people, um, you know, getting, uh, 
more value out of their workday by not giving their full attention to the boss. After all, they're not giving you the full uh, value of their labor. Not that they would ever give you the full value of their labor. Even in socialism, there would be, you know, things uh, going to the uh, the collective uh, good. But um, in capitalism, it's it's pretty extreme uh, extraction of surplus value. Democracy Now is doing some stellar coverage of Gaza. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're covering the resistance a little less, but they're covering the humanitarian stuff very well. And yeah, also Electronic Intifada, which covers the resistance a bit more, as we are discussing in a previous stream. I feel like a piece of shit for checking out of the news cycle on Palestine because it's enough to make me lose my mind. Definitely, you can get vicarious trauma just from watching the news on that. Like, it's... The people going through it directly, I don't know, like they're going to need so much help going on uh, because it's so terrible. Even, you know, as the saying goes, witnesses to violence are victims of violence. I mean, also like direct victims of violence are victims of violence, obviously. But um, the way that the human mind works, also just even seeing this stuff, it can have a pretty dramatic, traumatic effect. And, um, you know, take a break, come back. I mean, it's incumbent on us to do whatever kind of support work that we can and um, do everything you can. If you burn out, it's not going to serve anybody in the long term. There's a lot of interesting information out there about Nazi Zionist collaboration and the Havara agreement that is circulating at the moment. I don't know anything about that. If somebody wants to share some info, I'd appreciate it. The CPUSA abandoned Marxism-Leninism. So this is a link somebody has in the chat. Thank you, John. From Unity Struggle Unity. We've read, actually we read a piece from the Unity Struggle Unity journal about COVID a while back. Just waiting for this to load. In its members' own words, the CPUSA, Communist Party of the United States, abandons Marxism-Leninism. This is dated today, April 4. On March 29, the National Committee of CPUSA released an article entitled Build the Party, Build the Clubs, a so-called discussion document for the forthcoming convention. However, as the party tacitly confirmed in its article, how does the Communist Party elect its leadership? No genuinely democratic discussion will be possible at the convention. So that's why they're so shitty just decade after decade. There was somebody recently that was like, what party do I join? I haven't seen anything from CPUSA pretty much since the Gus Hall years. I'm not sure a lot has changed. You know, they still are kind of, uh, in, as they said on Twitter, small D Democrats. <laughs> I feel like that particular linguistic blunder uh, kind of sums it up. But um, anyway, continuing this article, the very mechanisms that CPUSA leadership lauds as, quote, probably the most democratic process possible, okay, are actually tools of centralized control which stifle emerging revolutionary voices within the party and protect the interests of an entrenched clique of desiccated opportunists such as John Bactel and the current co-chairs of the party, Joe Sims and Rosanna Cabron. Um, yeah, John Bactel used to be uh, the chair as well, uh, not that long ago, I think. Uh, oh yeah, he was the guy we did, we read an article about, I think from Comrade Rene, about... Um, how he was like an Obama campaign guy. He worked for Obama. And then he was like, a, yeah, this is, I mean, the when they talk about CPUSA leadership being opportunist, I mean, people talk about CPUSA versus DSA. And I'm like, if you want to do one of the two, go join DSA because they at least don't pretend to be Marxist-Leninist. And they have a much bigger base and they're actually doing real work. I mean, I've seen the DSA um, do actual real work and, you know, it, it varies widely depending on where you are. Uh, the, the chapters or locals are like really different from place to place. In some places, they're just as much, you know, a caucus of the Democratic Party and firmly, you know, opportunist with regard to the Democratic Party. There's other places where they're more independent and they're more, you know, it is more of an independent proletarian class uh, perspective represented by the party and less opportunist. So... Anyway, yeah, if you're going to do one, do the bigger one that's doing real work. And if they're going to be opportunist and somewhat liberal, at least they can not pretend to be ML in the process. 
Uh, I think that's just extra harmful. But anyway, the slate system, as the clarion has highlighted in the cult building tendency, is a slate which enables the outgoing national committee to re-elect itself and bolster the compliant toadies within its ranks. It all but guarantees the expulsion or ostracization of clubs and party members who aren't in on the grift. The dues must flow to the coffers of People's World, Workers Education Society, and all the other shell corporations chaired by the aforementioned husks. After all, those who control the dues control the party. And what is that party? One would expect a party that is communist in name, as I would say, you know, the Communist Party of the United States uh, is their name. Uh, you would expect them to espouse at least some communist principles about the forms that the party should take. According to Build the Party, Build the Clubs, the, quote, cadre model of a revolutionary working class party tailored to fit Russia's conditions at the turn of the century, give me a fucking break, has been replaced as conditions have changed, unquote, and, quote, in its stead, at Lenin's initiative, the international communist movement adopted new organizational principles for countries with bourgeois democracies. This new version was called a mass party. Well, you have a vanguard party and you have mass parties, but, I mean, the vanguard and the masses are different things. The vanguard is just a relative term. It means the most class conscious portion of the masses. And so there's a party for the vanguard because a certain discussion is possible there. And then there's parties to help direct and guide uh, mass and just organize mass behavior and mass struggle. So anyway, their justification here rests on the phrases conditions have changed. That's what they revisionists are always like, uh, you know, explaining to you why Marx is no longer relevant or Lenin is no longer relevant, etc. And on evoking, I mean, so the opposite of this is formalism, where you do just mindlessly copy forms regardless of conditions. But this is not one of those cases. So anyway, and on evoking Lenin's name to subvert his revolutionary formulations, they do not and cannot specify what has changed, nor can they quote Lenin directly at the risk of proving themselves to be liars and distorters. So this is actually like a pretty long article. Let's just skip down to last uh, paragraph or two. Such organizations exist only to siphon dues and shove revolutionary energy and revolutionaries back toward the Democratic Party. Amen. Whether the CPUSA or some fragments of it can escape this dead alley is undetermined. The slow liquidation of the party has been an ongoing struggle since the party's earliest days. And, you know, to comment on that, that's what we're talking about in the Browderism playlist. When we come back to the Browderist playlist, it's going to be in the 1940s. And um, basically what uh, Browder led was an effort to change the name of the Communist Party, but basically dissolve the Communist Party and create the CPA instead, which was would not be a regular Communist Party. So they were liquidating the Communist Party. They had also um, withdrawn from the Communist International earlier than its disbanding, I think in 1941. So, yeah, I mean, the liquidation of the party, that was definitely part of uh, Browderism and Browder's revisionism. So... But if CPUSA actually develops party activists who are well-versed in theory and practice, as well as the history of Marxist-Leninist politics, as they claim to want to do in Build the Party, Build the Clubs, then those activists could well become the counter-revolutionary leadership's grave diggers. Yeah. I mean, and that's what we would love to see. You have, on the one hand, infracell has been out there for years. Uh, for people who don't know what that is, there's another channel, Infrared. We call them infracell because they're basically fucking, like, fascist incels. But they're, uh, they're like, we need a takeover of CPUSA to turn them into, like, a more vigorous, opportunist, revisionist, you know, pro-Russia-China kind of thing. Um, but, no, 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 we need actual Marxism-Leninism in there. And, uh, you know, far from it for me to be like, go take over CPUSA, I don't know if uh, that's really worth the effort. What I would like to see is people studying anti-revisionist and just, you know, regular, because Lenin was anti-revisionist, obviously, you know, look at pieces like Marxism and revisionism. Uh, Lenin was obviously anti-revisionist. And when we talk about anti-revisionism, it's trying to hold to uh, Lenin's updating of Marxism for the era of imperialism and proletarian revolution in the 20th century. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we want to stick to that. And uh, I would like to see people studying that and you know, doing mass work while also forming the the kind of smaller groups of, you know, vanguard study, that would be great. But 
I mean, bottom line, we do need to rebuild the, the mass organizations like labor unions, which are at an all time low right now, starting maybe to have a little bit of an uptick. But as far as membership, they're really at an all time low. And uh, so you need to get that going again. It's, in other words, it's not just a question of getting the right study groups going again. Absolutely not. We do need that so that when the labor movement gets going, we have some people that can give some advice and direction and rather than just relying on spontaneous mistake making from start to finish, you know, trial and error. We don't need to do that. We have uh, 175 years of Marxism and 200 years of socialist struggle to draw from, you know, people who study that like I do and like other people um, that, you know, I know there's a lot of people that just house the videos, everything I put out, they're just there on it, re-listening. That's awesome. I, I you know, I was going to say, uh, to a certain extent, the channel has grown a lot, at least superficially. The subscriber count on the YouTube is up to like 21,400. And that's awesome. But at the same time, if you dig past that, um, a lot of the videos don't really have more views than they did two years ago, which tells me something. There is increased nominal interest in communism, Marxism, Marxism, Leninism. That's good. And I would much rather that people read at least two or three Marxist, Marxist, Leninist audiobooks than zero. So that's great. And there are certain videos that have, you know, 15,000, 20,000 views that are dense theory texts. And that's awesome that people are getting into that and starting to digest it. I would much rather that they get, you know, two or three audiobooks into their system than zero. But what I'm seeing is there still isn't that um, kind of mass drive, you know, for the really challenging stuff. I mean, I think that as far as the theory text, some of it has gone up more recently, like in the last year, some of the like Hoja texts about China and whatnot have gotten up to like 2000 views, which again is great for you're listening to like a two hour, pretty dense, you know, audiobook by some guy that died decades ago and so on. You know, for a lot of people that just sounds boring, but we're getting people that are getting into that. But again, as the channel um, sub count goes up, I'm still finding that the, the numbers on those audiobooks aren't going up so much. So we're seeing a lot of people that click the subscribe button and hey, that's great. It's, you know, getting the channel around to more people and maybe they listen to the state and revolution. Maybe they listen to value, price and profit. Maybe they listen to reform or revolution by Luxembourg, et cetera. I'd rather them, you know, listen to at least a few things than zero, but it's still not really deeply entrenched. I think that if you look at the channels that are growing more rapidly, it's the easier to digest content that isn't very challenging and that tells people what they want to hear, whether it's that, you know, the Democratic Party is reformable and they're your friend, or whether it's just we just have to root for Russia, or, you know, whatever other kind of bullshit it is that does not really challenge people to think in a revolutionary way. Okay, so, you know, that that's one of the lessons that I've learned uh, running this channel. We're still, we still haven't seen that, and so I'm still waiting for that. But for those who are here and those who are, you know, actually... In, in they're like drop the next when you drop the next it's funny to me i get comments like when's the next audiobook when's the next and i'm like whoa um are you even a patron like are you even like supporting um you know not that that's a requirement but it's like hey if you want to see more content drop a few dollars in there because it literally is buying you know my time uh, i will give as much time to this as i possibly can afford to you can help me afford more of it is what i'm trying to say but um yeah, it's it's just interesting to me that that although the absolute, you know, superficial numbers have gone up, there's a lot more subs now. A lot of people really struggle with engaging at that deeper level and okay, you know, it is what it is. But the good news is there's at least a thousand of us that are regularly getting into the theory and, you know, we thousand can do a lot is what I'm trying to say. And we'll see where that goes in the future. All right, let's finish this up. Um the true Marxist-Leninist strain, long asleep, and seldom dominant within CPUSA must awaken. What this strain does once it is awake remains to be seen. Perhaps the party can be purged of its revisionist and careerist leadership. And that's what I was saying before. You know, maybe it can, maybe, I, maybe it can't. I'm not trying to lead any specific effort. What I want to do is educate people, do general agitation, general education, 
and let you figure it out. You know, I mean, I'll try to uh, at least help people towards some more advanced conclusions. But as far as, you know, the organizing, I'm not trying to dictate what you're doing as far as organizing. I'll give you a few of my opinions, but, you know, we don't have any specific campaign on that. Um, anyway, more likely, however, than the party being purged of its revisionist and careerist leadership and being reconstituted is that these true Marxist-Leninists must extricate themselves, pull themselves out from the dead hulk that surrounds them and join with the rest of the Marxist-Leninists in North America toward the foundation of a communist party that bridges the mystifying state lines of the U.S. and Canada, a communist party of sort of, you know, uh, Anglo-American North America, I guess. I don't, you know, that's that's their goal is the U.S. and Canada there. Um, it, you know, that, that threw me for a loop a little bit, I guess. But, um, it, I mean, it's true. Canada has a lot in common with the northern U.S. I think uh, most of the population of Canada lives within 50 miles of the U.S. border, partly for climate reasons, but, uh, you know, pretty cold up there. But anyway, um, you know, whatever it is you're going to do, yeah, we do need a party and we don't have that party yet. I don't know what that looks like. You know, they're saying a U.S.-Canada party. I don't know. It could be. It could be. I have no idea. But uh, what we need to do is get the struggle going as strong as we can. And like when we read the economy stuff, I think there's going to be another 2008 type event in the next couple of years. Um, you know, it's not, that, oh, it's three months away. Yeah, it's funny. You watch some of these like investment channel things and they do like doom content every day. And so every video title is like, it's here. Worse than you thought. The crash is not, you know, it's, and they're not wrong, but it's like they're, they're announcing on a daily basis something that is a slow process. So it's kind of like watching a snail crawl across the room and it's like an inch closer now. It's like, okay, why don't you just update us when it's like a foot closer? How does that sound? But, and so, you know, they kind of make themselves sound a little bit silly sometimes. Um, that said, you know, it's interesting watching the day by day, I think. Anyway, John, thanks for that link. Ever think of inviting one of the comrades you've developed a rapport with to join a stream to offer some direct conversation and an additional voice? Um, I mean, let me put it this way. What, what goes on between me and people that I DM with is kind of individual and personal, I guess. Um, I will do all of the collaborations that makes sense you know what i mean but for a lot of people um the collaborating that i do just basically amounts in private conversations that actually do end up informing what happens on the stream i just don't bring them on because well for one reason usually it just never comes up and we're just chatting you know and it's 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 interesting you know there was somebody um i was working with recently who you know, I, I mean, I talk to a lot of people. I really enjoy uh, talking with this one particular person. And I was like, do you want to do a stream? And they're like, no, I just want to talk. So, you know, not everybody really wants to go out there. And that's totally okay. And I don't, I don't want to give people the idea. Because th there is also a tendency sometimes for uh, people who are, like, into this stuff to just kind of want to hop on stream and, like, be public all the time. And, you know, that's not actually how I do most of the stuff. Like, people send me links, we talk about it, and it's just kind of, it's between us, you know what I mean? It's not necessarily to be, like, product uh, to be put out there. So, um, it doesn't come up that much, I guess, is, is the bottom line. When it does come up, uh, you know, probably I'll do it. I've gotten a few invites that... I don't really regret not taking, uh, you know what I mean? There's, I, let me put it this way, doing this channel for the four years that I have been doing it, it, the question of who you actually trust to work with consistently is kind of constantly shifting. There's certain people who I think are on a level above where I'm at and I would pretty much trust regardless because they've been going for a while and everything I see them do is really high quality. But there's only a handful of people like that, plus, <laughs> like, they don't necessarily want to do anything with me. 
So in other words, I'm a little bit skeptical sometimes of when people want to do stuff because a lot of times it is part of that clout game that I do not play the game. So um, yeah, a lot of times I just chat with people and it doesn't necessarily turn into an interview, but those conversations may inform what you see on the channel. A lot of the readings come from private conversations, you know? So that's the way I like to keep it. I think people in general are more comfortable kind of being off the record. So um, it's not that I'm trying to hold anybody back from anything like that, but it's just, I think it's a lot easier that way. You know, you can get into drama with people pretty quickly um, as far as like, oh, you said you would link my channel or you said you would uh, come on my show and this and that. And it, it all gets very middle school, like pretty quickly. And I'm just, I'm not here for that. So Anyway, if you have a follow-up, uh, feel free to ask, but that's some of the process there. I recently joined DSA, and what I've seen so far is extremely promising, specifically in terms of a stance on the relationship of leftist organizations to the Democratic Party. That's good, and like I said, it, I think people are getting it, that the Dems suck, and they're a dead end and useless, and, and so on. And I think we need to, as communists, accelerate that process. If you go back to Lenin... One of the things that, you know, he's talking about a lot, it's it's like a foundation in Marxism-Leninism, is uh, the independent political class position of, of the proletariat. You need proletarian independence. And then this comes into play later in things like the Popular Front, where if you're going to be, uh, as communists, um, working in a political capacity with non-communist proletarian elements like social democracy or you're going to be working in an anti-fascist popular front with quote anti-fascist bourgeois parties you need your um, independence in there uh, your ideological um, stringency as the proletariat to be clear and well-defined so that it does not get bogged down through the process of collaborating with uh, you know, non-communist elements. It is possible for communists to collaborate with non-communists uh, without it becoming opportunist or revisionist, but it takes, you know, real ideological discipline to do that. And I think that the more we can encourage and help foster that, the better. And there's a lot of lessons from history about that. So I think that's definitely one of our tasks as communists to, uh, to do that. But speaking of people who I chat with, there's somebody I've been chatting with for a long time who was kind of raised in a Democratic Party family. Um, you know, like a lot of their family is kind of like involved with the Democratic Party in different ways. And they get a real insider view on it. And they see, um, you know, the way that that party works. And they've been involved with DSA. And they've, you know, had conversations with people about kind of fighting the Democratic Party and stuff. And, uh you know, it's an ongoing struggle. This is one of the things peeling the U.S. left away from the Democratic Party. Uh, it's key, again, I think building up a labor movement that is more militant, is more socialist, that doesn't lean on an imperialist, you know, obviously capitalist party, but advanced capitalist imperialist party like the Democratic Party. You know, that is really key. And these discussions are going on behind the scenes. You know, things are always in flux. We, we do happen to be at a pretty shitty point right now, but I do see people starting to figure it out and we need to just help it along as much as we can in every way that we can. That doesn't always mean being, you know, brute force aggressive. Um, sometimes you really do get more flies with honey than vinegar. It just depends. You know, it's having the conversations in ways that make sense for getting people to the next uh, step. All right, debt doom is real. Uh, I had a close person in my life attempt to unalive themselves because of debts and necessary expenses due to an injury that requires surgery. They can't work, and it's so sad that this is the system. I'm considering selling my home while it's still high and then move in with family. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this is not a financial advice channel, but um, definitely the market seems to be at a high right now. You know, you might want to just watch what the trends are in your area as far as if it's, you know, let's put it this way. Once the prices start to drop, they're probably going to drop quickly. So, you know, keep an eye on that and 
do do your research, like do your do, due diligence on that. But that is uh, what a lot of investors are doing from all this kind of news that I've been watching. Um, that obviously it's more aimed at uh, small investors. It, it's not the kind of MSNBC, CNBC kind of stuff where it's just like keep investing in all the big stocks, like, and they'll keep telling you that right up as it's crashing, basically. But it's some of the more savvy, you know, for people who actually are trying to become uh, more, like, independent investors, you know, they're trying to actually get rich from this rather than just, like, maintaining uh, savings or something like that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that people noted is Warren Buffett, um, his company, pulled just cashed out of uh they had a lot of stock in i think it was dr horton one of the big three housing construction companies they just like sold all their stock basically uh because the the housing construction boom is over now those houses are on the market and they're sitting there they're trying to get four hundred and fifty thousand for them okay that's not working then they're going to try to sell them for four hundred thirty thousand. that doesn't sell so you got empty houses that they built and paid for, uh, and you know now they got to sell them for four hundred ten thousand, and so on. As that goes down, I mean you're gonna you're gonna start to see that new construction drag down the prices of existing non-new housing for you know resale. Not every area has all that new construction though, so it's gonna take a while for this to pervade and you know spread through the whole uh, national economy. But it's already happening in, in some other countries too, and. You know, you get the sense that it's around the corner. Anyway, but that is the idea, is, you know, buy low, sell high, and then use the cash from selling high to buy stuff in the next crash. Actually, from another thing, uh, what I was uh, watching, what they were saying, they uh, had a quote from one of the upper BlackRock people, huge investment firm, and basically what BlackRock does is they wait for a crash, and when the prices hit bottom, they watch it closely, and when prices come up 10% from the bottom, that's when they start buying investments again because it's clear that it's leaving the bottom. So, you know, I guess similar logic applies to the top if you're trying to sell off stuff, you know, while you can get good money for it and then just hold on to, you know, the cash as the price drops and then buy stuff. This is how people, you know, wind up acquiring a lot more capital. Now, not everybody can do this. I'm not trying to say this like, oh, it's a way out of capitalism. No, not at all. This is just, you know, how successful petty bourgeois who actually do become bigger bourgeois behave. Uh, and, you know, that's that's the way it works. But it is musical chairs. You know, it's like the lottery, uh, thousands will enter, few will win kind of thing. Uh, it's not a system that really works for everybody. It's a system of exploitation where, again, there's a few winners and everybody else just works to make them rich and, and they get exploited by them. But, yeah, totally. I mean... If you can protect yourself, uh, you know, if you have any any kind of assets at all, keep an eye on what's going on because uh, you could stand to lose or gain in this situation, uh, even just for your own use. Regarding the housing market, I found Jason Walter on YouTube to be a reliable source of info without a lot of the right wing stuff that you see on Reventure. See, it's funny you say that about Reventure. I didn't think Reventure was actually that bad about the right wing stuff. Uh, compared to some other channels that talk about housing, Reventure is like, you know, <laughs> definitely more, they're more middle of the road. I mean, they talk to investors, but they all kind of also talk to, uh, you know, just regular house buyers for personal use, too. Um, compared to some of them, Reventure is very, very neutral. Uh, he's a little dry, but he dives into a lot of data and has been accurate over the past few years I've been watching. I don't think I've heard of him. Oh, actually, your link came up. Uh, oh, that's why came up with a 404 let me see if i can find it i don't think i've seen this guy's videos before but i'll take a look oh yeah i see jason walter it is a real estate agent in sacramento well the thing okay i gotta say if you're watching real estate agents you really gotta be careful because their job is to sell stuff so they're they're salespeople, and that comes with all the kind of bullshit that you know any kind of sales job comes with so you know, what realtors want you to do is buy, 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 because that's how they make money. You know, they're on commissions, basically. So uh, they want you to buy whether it's a good time to buy or not, and they'll just feed you a line of bullshit about how it's a good time to buy when it isn't. So just be careful about that if you're listening to realtors, you know. 
Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff you can. Let me put it this way: the best investors that I've seen are super neutral about what they're investing in. They really don't. I mean, and this is part of the sort of inhumanity of the capitalist system. But they really don't care what they're investing in. They're just like, if I can buy low and sell high, I will buy low and sell high. And that's it. Like, that's all they care about. They don't care what it is. They're not emotionally attached to it. And so, uh, you know, they don't have as much of that kind of vested interest. Whereas, again, with like real estate agents, they're kind of always like trying to tell people it's a good time to buy even when it isn't. Loving the thumbnails. Keep it up. All right. I, I enjoyed it. It was like doing a little uh, little cartoon there. I had fun with that. Had an interaction with someone recently claimed that Leninism inherently bars workers from owning the means of production because the Vanguard Party has, quote, opposed interests. Now, the Vanguard Party is not another class, so that's just a misunderstanding. He was being super condescending about being a studied Marxist. Oh, so he's like an, quote, orthodox Marxist, anti-Leninist lefcom. Uh, quote, it's a power structure to control the workers and therefore inherently opposes them. Um, I would call it living in reality where you need to have a worker's state. And I don't know what this person thinks that would look like. It's like anarchists. Every time you break it down, they just wind up describing what the Soviet Union had just in different words. So, yeah. What food is going on your first cooking with S4A thumbnail or show? Uh, wheat. Wheat is going to be the first food. We're going to talk about wheat. Uh, it's sort of a daunting task. I should have probably picked a smaller topic. And maybe I will, but that's the plan, is to do the wheat show. I'm sure we'll come back to wheat, because it's a gigantic staple food that can be turned into so many different things. Bread, pasta can be eaten as just the whole grain. I mean, wheat is grass seed, basically. All the cereals, they're um, grasses. Grasses are really simple plants they grow easily in a lot of different climates but everything corn oat barley wheat it's grass basically that we have cultivated to have really big seeds and uh this is the case with cultivated food in general versus wild food what you get with wild food is smaller food with more intense flavor that's usually the thing so like if you look at a carrot carrots have been cultivated and domesticated and bred to have traits like larger size more sugar so more calories uh you know they're not just like fiber in other words uh so larger size more calories or sugar uh and then also to have the colors the purple and the orange actually the first cultivated carrots were purple not not orange. we think of them as being orange today but you can actually find that if you go to more specialty stores or i think even like a trader joe's has a bag of like variety you know, white, they look like parsnips, but there's white carrots, uh, white, yellow, orange, and purple carrots. And, um, but yeah, I think actually the purple carrots that were domesticated first. Anyway, if you look at a wild carrot, which is actually the same plant as Queen Anne's Lace, very common roadside weed. Uh, look up Queen Anne's Lace. You've probably seen it before. Um, that is wild carrot. And if you dig up the root, it's a biennial, it lives two years. If you dig up the root, it'll be like one to three inches long, and it's white. It looks like the white carrots, maybe like a slightly tan or beige color, but pretty much white. Um, but if you rub the plant, and you do have to be careful with wild carrot, uh, because it not all um, wild foods have lookalikes, but uh, wild carrot does. Uh, it has hemlock as a lookalike, which is a really bad lookalike because it's highly poisonous. But as long as you can tell your Queen Anne's Lace from your hemlock, you'll be fine. And one of the ways you can do it is wild carrot smells like carrot, hemlock doesn't. But, um, so, you know, you have to obviously kill the plant to dig up the root because that's how it's anchored to the ground. Uh, another part of wild carrot that you can use is the seed. You can uh, take the seed of wild carrot. It's actually related to fennel and some other plants that we do use the aromatic seeds for. And so you can like collect the dried seed in the fall and uh, you can grind it up and use it as a condiment. And, um, you know, people make like a chutney with it in a similar way that you would do a caraway or a fennel seed because they're related. So anyway, uh, but what I was saying is wild foods, they tend to be smaller and with a more concentrated flavor. 
but uh, you know, kind of like uh, grass growing on your lawn. That is by and large edible, um, but it's not really bred for taste or it's bre not bred for nutrition. Whereas the wheat and corn and whatever else, it's bred to have, you know, uh, really usable uh, grain where you can just plant a few of them and you get maximal kind of food back. You know, a lot of starch and, and stuff like that. That's calories um, and, you know, also protein and other stuff. But anyway, yeah, wheat, that is probably going to be the first uh, thing. And like I said... Uh, thank you for reminding me, actually. Uh, I promised to do the first Cooking with S4A segment by the end of the month. I probably will start out just doing that as like a feature within a stream, you know, so for maybe an hour, uh, and uh, then we'll do a chat afterwards. Like it might not be a standalone, but I will break it out and uh, post it. So anyway, there you go. We, uh, let's see. So that conversation with that orthodox Marxist was silly, and I asked him why he turned away from Leninism, and he basically admitted he'd only read a little bit of Lenin. Oh, God! And then recommended a YouTube channel called Anarch, L-M-A-O. So Anarch, A-N-A-R-K, for people who don't know, is a fucking deranged anarchist. This guy is so unhinged. Go start, go, go, uh, go make an offensive comment. If you want to see um, how easy it is to just, like, get under this guy's skin... Go find Anarch on Twitter and just, like, ask, like, the mildest questions and, uh, boy, will it escalate quickly. Yeah, actually, one of the very first reaction video requests that I ever got on the channel was for Anarch's The State is Counter-Revolutionary, which is a four-part torrent of bullshit. I actually started recording a response to it back in 2020, and I was like, I had to stop because it was just... There was nothing in it that was, like, remotely true. It was just lots of incredibly bad talking points. I mean, if there's another channel listening, like... Fin I know Finball has done a lot of, uh, uh, like... He's done some, like, anarcho-communist kind of response videos. I don't have it in me to take on Anarch's thing alone. Uh, but if somebody else wanted to... Who actually knows what they're talking about, and that, that is a short list, <laughs> wanted to do that... Uh, yeah, Anarch is fucking terrible, honestly. But it's, like, so typical of Anarchist stuff. Uh, I mean, it's just that channel is nails on chalkboard for me right down to the intro. He's like, hey, Anarch here. And if you've heard the channel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Guy is so full of himself, it's, like, unbelievable. And he's just so wrong, and it's so painful. All right, anyway. We got a link here from the Kites Journal about... The new Communist Party of Canada, I guess people in Canada founded another Communist Party. In a way, I really wish people would wait uh, because, you know, just founding new party after new party after new party, I, I don't know. At, at a certain point, it's just demoralizing to me. But thank you for the uh, article. I, I got to, uh, for today, stay on track and otherwise we're never going to get to the uh, <laughs> to the stuff that I already screenshotted. But thank you for that, uh, Poet. Yeah, saying that the uh, the Vanguard Party inherently opposes the population is like saying that the coach inherently opposes the players of a sports team. That I think is actually a pretty good uh, metaphor. For real, I was trying to explain it wasn't like a ruling body that a communist political party can serve as the Vanguard, but it's just the most educated and class conscious members of the proletariat. In other words, people who are actually ready to take that political leadership on. And he basically just C-lined. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. Is the NEP an extension of what they called war communism? I would say no. Uh, that's kind of a different topic. War communism has more to do with the kind of, you know, rationing and stuff that even the capitalist countries do under that intense stress of wartime. And that, that is kind of the banner excuse for all of the, you know, kind of uh, barracks communism, I think is another term for that. But no, the NEP was more of a long-term plan that Lenin had. He thought it would last a few decades uh, of allowing small business so that industry and class formation could continue to develop because capitalism was not that developed in Russia. It was developing rapidly, but um, in one of the pieces that we did, and I can't remember the title offhand, but we covered it, I think, as a standalone audiobook and then also in a stream a while back. Um, Lenin was talking, he was describing that simultaneously in Russia at the time of the revolution, 
There were socialist elements established by the new Bolshevik government. There were state capitalist or highly organized, uh, consolidated, monopoly capital stuff that had good systems of accounting and were very trackable. Then there was just other private capitalism at a lower level. There was also the petty bourgeois peasant economy. And then there were like quasi-feudal elements, I think. So there were like five simultaneously existing uh, modes of production in, in Russia at that time. So part of the NEP was like trying to get the more advanced capital capitalist elements uh, better developed and organized so that they could be turned into socialist elements more easily. That was the goal. And uh, it, it didn't really go that way. And then in 1928, Stalin really bumped up the process because it, it just wasn't really working out as planned. So, but it's like, I feel like uh, Stalin gets shit no matter like what he did. It's like, first, the Bolsheviks are, quote, just state capitalists because they had the NEP. Well, Russia was very economically backward. And so they did as much uh, collectivization as they could, and, but they, they did not have the resources. It was not an available option on the table to collectivize everything else that wasn't that developed. So they would rather do supervised capitalism for a while. Like, and, and you can read this in the Tax in Kind. We have it on the channel uh, by Lenin. And uh, so they, they do that for a while. And then Stalin does the, you know, steps toward collectivization in 1928. And now he's a brutal monster because he took away the Kulaks' land. Meanwhile, the Kulaks are burning their grain, slaughtering their cattle, and burying their gold out of literally, and if I can't have it, no one will kind of thing. And so it's just, uh, it, it's an extremely difficult period I really want to dig into more. Um, because, again, I think some regrettable things happened that did create cracks and fissures in the party and weaken the party moving forward. At the same time, they were building socialism. Like, they, they were doing the thing. And you can see this in the way that their economy behaved. But, uh, you know, I, I think this is this is another, when Marx and Engels predicted that uh, capitalism would be ended first in the most advanced capitalist countries. I think that that is still possible. It just may happen way later than they expected. And that a lot of the other revolutions that took place did have elements of, or more elements of completing the bourgeois revolution or just kind of almost being out and out more of a bourgeois revolution in the first place. Um, you know, obviously with proletarian leadership, so had different characteristics. But a lot of the tasks and development were still kind of more like tasks of the bourgeoisie that the revolution had to do just to get uh, the social development, historical development up to a point where socialism could even be built. So uh, anyway, you know, it, it's uh, and we've seen a lot of those projects that were, did start in the less developed countries uh, encounter severe difficulties. So it might be in the end, the socialism that really sticks does come out of the imperial core. Um, but, you know, that the whole thing was just on a much longer timeline than Marx and Engels uh, anticipated. And that's by no means, this is just some private thoughts of mine. Well, <laughs> not private anymore, but I mean, just some personal thoughts of mine. This isn't like coming from somebody else's reading. These are some of my own thoughts, having done a lot of this uh, study for a while now. That's by no means to say that there shouldn't have been a Russian revolution or there shouldn't have been a Chinese revolution or so on. No, absolutely. Uh, give imperialism all the resistance that you possibly can and hold on to your socialist projects as long as you possibly can the reality is we have seen a lot of those crack and falter and to me it's about trying to understand and explain why did that happen so all right anyway do you think that mao maoism and the communist party of china even before deng xiaoping's takeover the whole capitalist road thing is revisionist lately i've been leaning toward a yes to that question when reading works by Mao himself, as well as anti-revisionists who also were critical of the Chinese Communist Party, like Hoja, Bland, Bill Bland, and more. Um, yes, I think that... Uh, so I actually had a comment recently. Let me just read this out. And uh, there was somebody basically asking me, when am I going to, quote, continue down the path of Maoism? And the answer is, I don't think that I am, because, uh, well... You know, I think that there are things far worse than Maoism, uh, definitely. Uh, so, okay, here, here's the comment. Will you please address Marxism-Leninism-Maoism as a third and highest stage of Marxism on the channel sometime soon? 
And I have discussed this in streams, and my current opinion is that I don't really regard it as a third and higher stage of Marxism. So that is currently my opinion on it. Um, but anyway, as they say, it would be a very quick read to do on Marxism, Leninism, Maoism by the Peruvian Communist Party. It's eight pages. Or if you have a bit more time, hold high the bright red banner of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism by the Communist Party of India, Maoist. It's 40 pages. Um, so this is fairly readily available, and I'm sure you can find it in a few different formats. I see you on the path to Maoism, and I think that you should take the leap into studying it. So we have done texts from Maoist authors. This is an anti-revisionist channel. It took me a while to kind of size all of that up. It took a few years of reading fundamentals and foundational Marxist texts to kind of figure out where did I stand on you know, various things in Soviet history and Chinese history, etc., to have an actually informed take that wasn't just regurgitating propaganda I heard from some fucking LaRouche account on Twitter or some shit like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, we do anti-revisionist content. I consider Maoism, I mean, they, they reach some of the same conclusions, uh, like they're critical of the capitalist rotors in China. There's some other stuff in Maoism that I, I also don't, you know, entirely agree with. And so the, the thing that it's a third and higher stage of Marxism, I'm just not really sure that I agree with that claim based on what I've read. I would like at some point, having done more Hoja, who to me is like one of the anti-revisionist Marxist-Leninists, who's a very dedicated Marxist-Leninist, you know, lived up into the 80s, was commenting on current events and, and world dynamics that late, you know, that recently in history, just a few decades ago, uh, a lot of that stuff is like still in motion today. After studying a lot more of that, like I'm really looking forward to one of the odds and ends I want to do after the Browder playlist is Hoja's uh, Imperialism and the Revolution. It seems to me like his magnum opus because um, some people, you know, consider Albania to have been kind of like a, uh, like a form of Maoism in that they both uh, were critical of Khrushchevite revisionism or modern revisionism in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And they did have a lot in common. However, um, getting into the 70s, like late into Mao's life and then after Mao died, Hoja became like a lot more critical of what China was doing. And he addresses this. Actually, there was a comment. Uh, somebody had said, you know, Hoja did a complete about face about China. First, he was saying that they were building socialism and then he's calling them revisionist and that they were revisionist from the start. And he never self-criticizes about this and he never gives any basis for why he changed his mind about China. And the thing is, he actually does. Um, and I was talking with somebody about that recently. Again, one of these private theory discussions that I just have with people who listen to the channel and, and also just study Marxism. And I ask them questions. You know, I'm not like the be all end all authority. I'm a student of this as well. And I was asking them because they read a lot more Hoja than I do. I was like, did Hoja ever explain, you know, the about face on China? And they provided a bunch of quotes where basically Hoja was like, you know, we took them at their word because they had the correct position on Khrushchevite or modern revisionism. So we figured that they were doing the correct stuff. However, when some fault lines started to appear in the 70s, we got more critical. We found that they weren't publishing all of their statistics. And then uh, they weren't publishing all of the materials about their party. And some of what we did see was contradicting some of what they were saying. So, no, he actually does explain why he became more critical of China towards the end. And uh, then, you know, there's also people who were more in that, um, you know, late stage Marxist, Leninist, anti-revisionist. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm loath to say Hojaist because I don't, I don't really think it's anything super specific to Hoja necessarily. It's, it's anti-revisionist Marxism, Leninism uh, that you know, applies the principles that we know whether Hoja exists or not. But, uh, but Hoja was, you know, uh, a prolific writer and commented on many, you know, commented prolifically on many, many topics, whether it was Titoism or Eurocommunism or Dungus Chinese capitalism uh, and so on. You know, really, uh, or the Khrushchevite modern revisionism. He wrote huge, really, really lengthy texts about all of that stuff. And I think that those are great to study to get an anti-revisionist, Marxist, Leninist position on it. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff that I don't think that uh, Mao 
you know, everything he wrote was terrible or anything like that. But there are definitely some anti-revisionist, uh, Marxist-Leninist criticisms of Mao that do point to various deviations within even what we would call it, not necessarily Marxism-Leninism, Maoism per se, but even Mao Zedong thought. So anyway, uh, what do I think? Uh, that's still a work in progress. Again, one of the criticisms of Hoja is that he lays the blame for the capitalist rotors at Mao's feet for basically saying like the Communist Party of China never properly formed. And some of this was coming directly from Mao. And then uh, sadly, the same thing happened in Albania. The guy that uh, took over as the head after Hoja kind of did the same capitalist road type of stuff, which led international uh, Hoja fans to be like, what the fuck are you doing? So anyway, uh, still working on that, looking very much forward to doing imperialism in the revolution. I know that Finball has said he's working on an audiobook of the Titoites by Hoja, so uh, a lot of, lot of stuff there. In the end, revisionism, you know, it'll have slightly different national features, but it's always the restoration of capitalism, it's always reformism, it, it always has kind of the same basic characteristics in the end so it's kind of interesting seeing how similar it is from country to country but anyway so yeah jury is out for me uh, i don't know but i will say that there's things about Ma the other and let me just say this too uh another reason that maoism as in marxism leninism maoism has not really won me over the attacks on hoja for example i mean it's not just on hoja but i, I happen to have seen it the most there I find them often to be disingenuous and just flat out inaccurate. Like they'll say, oh, Hoja never said this, or he did say this. And it's just like literally untrue. And I'm like, it seems like you're lying. I don't know if you know if you're lying, but anyway, yeah, there's just stuff about, <clears throat> there's just stuff about Maoism that uh, has not really clicked with me. So hence, no, I do not think that, you know, studying Marxism simply is a path toward Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. And no, I don't think I'm on it. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, somebody else is saying, I think that the NEP marked the end of so-called war communism. But I, I think uh, I basically is what I said, yeah. Mao, is, uh, Mao himself said some pretty galling things about courting capitalism and welcoming it from the West. Although whether that was just diplomacy or a genuine statement of values is up for debate. Um, you know, it's interesting because I have a feature planned. We're still in chat, but uh, I have a feature planned on Kissinger who, you know, if you will recall, um, China did some overtures to the West in the Nixon years, and there was definitely some talks with Kissinger about, uh, you know, they were trying to oppose the Soviet Union and thought that they would court the USA, at least to some extent, to do that. And later on, it looks like to a very great extent, until up to today. And I shared this on the uh, community tab uh, a while ago. But um, here is Xi Jinping. Uh, as I said, when you're definitely a communist, thumbs up. Yes, that was sarcastic. Uh, this is a story, I think, from Reuters. Yeah, Reuters. China's Xi gets nostalgic with, quote, old friend Kissinger. And then the highlighted part is, quote, the Chinese people never forget their old friends and Sino-U.S. relations will always be linked with the name of Henry Kissinger. Xi Jinping told Kissinger at uh so you know they were meeting at this uh event for dignitaries i mean do you want it to be linked with the name of kissinger because personally i i wouldn't so much there we go uh yeah there's a picture of them meeting together the old friends kissinger who was widely respected in china and has paid regular visits since leaving office said that he was grateful beijing had arranged the meeting in the building where he had met with chinese leaders during his first visit Quote, the relationship between our two countries is a matter of world peace and the progress of human society, China's official news agency, Xinhua, cited Kissinger as saying. And I can just hear all the dungists like, yeah, don't, it's like peace and prosperity. Do you really think Henry Kissinger is interested in human progress and peace? Are you insane? No, obviously that's not what this is about at all. So, you know what? Uh, I'll leave the chat where it is. Why don't we just go into the Kissinger thing right here? I think this is a good enough segue. So let me bring this up. All right. Henry Kissinger, The Man, The Myth, The War Criminal by Heather Mason, Red Spectre writer. And so this is found at the Red Spectre uh, website. 
All right, so Henry Kissinger, The Man, The Myth, The War Criminal by Heather Mason, Red Spectre writer. So this is from a few months ago when Kissinger died at the age of 100. Henry Kissinger dead. On November 29th, 2023, Henry Kissinger, former U.S. Secretary of State and diplomat, passed away in his Connecticut home. Following his death, he was praised by global leaders across the world, including Russian President Vladimir Putin, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Notably, Chinese President Xi Jinping stated in a message to American President Joe Biden that, quote, Kissinger's name will always be associated with China-U.S. relations. Dr. Kissinger will always be remembered and missed by the Chinese people. You can just see the tear, single tear forming in his eye. Unquote. Xi Jinping, November 2023. Henry Kissinger was a very influential man who had a large impact on global politics and international relations. So much, in fact, that even after he left office as Secretary of State, he still met with world leaders to discuss international relations, such as when, in July of this year, he met high-ranking Chinese politicians, including Xi Jinping, Defense Minister Li Shangfu, and senior, di and senior diplomat Wang Yi. He is especially notable for his role in negotiating the opening up of China to diplomatic relations with the U.S. under the Nixon administration, and for negotiating a ceasefire in Vietnam, the latter of which he won a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Astounding. The latter of which he won a Nobel Peace Prize for. During his award ceremony, he stated, quote, I am deeply moved by the award of the Nobel Peace Prize, which I regard as the highest honor one could hope to achieve in the pursuit of peace on this earth. When I consider the list of those who have been so honored before me, I can only accept this award with humility. The people of the United States, and indeed of the whole world, share the hope expressed by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee that all parties to this conflict will feel morally responsible for turning the ceasefire in Vietnam into a lasting peace for the suffering peoples of Indochina. Certainly my government, for its part, intends to continue to conduct its policies in such a way as to turn this hope into reality. Bro, you are literally killing them, like, en masse. I don't know, <laughs> you know, how anybody takes this seriously. Obviously, they also gave Obama one of these for, like, literally doing nothing. All right. So, getting into the specifics here, here's Henry Kissinger's actual legacy. Cambodia. What the international representatives of the bourgeoisie are not telling you is that Henry Kissinger was in fact a war criminal who did anything but, quote, bring peace to the suffering people of Indochina. Henry Kissinger played a significant role in orchestrating the carpet bombing of Cambodia, which he directed between the years of 1969 to 73. Under Kissinger, 500,000 bombs were dropped on Cambodia, killing an estimated 150,000 civilians. Not only that, he personally approved 3,875, personally approved, 3,875 bombing raids in Cambodia. But that doesn't even scratch the surface of this man's complete and utter hypocrisy. Chile. The classified documents from the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, also show that not only was Kissinger named supervisor of covert efforts to keep Salvador Allende from being inaugurated, he was also a major architect of the Pinochet coup, in which the Chilean military, under the leadership of Augusto Pinochet, bombed the Chilean presidential palace and overthrew the democratically elected Salvador Allende to establish a military dictatorship. By the way, if you're interested, we have four audiobooks from Salvador Allende on the channel, and they're pretty much like one from each year. It was like when he was running, when he first took office, when he was like a year or year and a half into office, and then his final speech just before he was assassinated, like when he was under siege. Very interesting. If you just do the Allende playlist, it'll take you through all four. Also, there is an Inverhoja text um, that is called, I think it's called the Tragic events in Chile, but just search on Chile and Hoja and you'll find that one. It's actually a very good summary of the fruits of revisionism because Allende got into office um, basically as a Marxist, but without doing Marxist-Leninist organizing or a revolution. They tried to do it purely through the bourgeois government and bourgeois democratic process. And what happened is they got fucking railroaded as soon as they actually got 
you know, any serious transformative efforts underway. So highly recommend uh, those audiobooks if you haven't listened to them already. Anyway, continuing. The imperialist that he was, when discussing the election of Salvador Allende in Chile with Richard Helms, former CIA director, Kissinger said that, quote, we will not let Chile go down the drain, unquote, from September 12, 1970. Said that on the phone. Kissinger later, in a memorandum to Nixon, acknowledged that Salvador Allende was legitimately elected. Quote, Allende was elected legally, the first Marxist government ever to come to power by free elections. He has legitimacy in the eyes of Chileans and most of the world. There's nothing we can do to deny him that. But anyway, yeah, saying that this guy won fair and square, the population views his election as legitimate, I guess we just have to, you know, go assassinate him and then support like a fascist military coup uh, to replace him. And that's because that's that's what they did. And so, again, this is one of the problems with the modern revisionist reformist, uh, you know, Marxist current or pseudo Marxist current, because it just sets you up for this kind of failure. If you do an actual revolution, it tends to work better. But anyway, yet caring little for democracy. That did not stop Kissinger from rapaciously backing up the military dictatorship in Chile. In, yeah, this great lover of world peace and human progress. In 1975, Kissinger showed his complete and utter lack of regard for human rights when he met the foreign minister of Chile's Pinochet regime. And rather than criticize the Pinochet government for human rights abuses, he had this to say, quote, Well, I read the briefing paper for this meeting, and it was nothing but human rights. The State Department is made up of people who have a vocation for the ministry. Because there were not enough churches for them, they went into the Department of State. And like, yeah, you know, like Kissner was like, I had to wear sunglasses. You know, the glare from their halos was just so fucking blinding. In 1976, he said to Pinochet that, Quote, my evaluation is that you are a victim of left-wing groups around the world. As you know, we are sympathetic with what you were trying to do here. I think that the previous government was headed toward communism. We wish your government well. It's Kissinger in June of 1976. How could you get more transparently disgusting than that? Bangladesh. During the Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971, the war in which Bangladesh fought to achieve its independence from Pakistan... Pakistan employed brutal repression and genocide against Bangladeshis, in which 200,000 to 400,000 Bengali women were raped, 500,000 to 3 million Bengalis were murdered, and 1.5 million Bengalis were forced to seek asylum in India. How did Kissinger, then U.S. Secretary of State, respond? Alongside President Richard Nixon, Kissinger infamously supported Pakistan, pushing for an unprecedented and sharp turn toward friendly relations with Pakistan, as Kissinger saw Pakistan as a conduit for friendly relations with China. Beyond just words, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon used the United States Navy to support Pakistan. On December 10, 1971, Kissinger and Nixon sent the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet from Vietnam to Sri Lanka, led by the USS Enterprise, the then world's largest nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. He also facilitated the export of military supplies to Pakistan from Jordan, Iran, and Turkey. To showcase the full moral depravity of Kissinger in regard to the Bangladesh Liberation War, the following is an excerpt from a conversation between Ki Nixon and Kissinger. Quote, Nixon bitterly said, the Indians need, what they really need is a, Kissinger interjected, they're such bastards. Nixon finished his thought, a mass famine. That's quoting Gary J. Bass in The Blood Telegram, Nixon, Kissinger, and a Forgotten Genocide. So that's, you know, this great lover of peace and human progress. What they really need is a mass famine. You know, just genocide. So there you go. Israel. All right. So uh, still in the news today. During the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Kissinger was still Secretary of State. Kissinger, however, did not approach this war from the perspective of principles or morals, for if he did, he would have recognized the right of the Palestinians to all of Palestine. As Israel was, and still is, a settler colonial state constructed entirely upon land stolen from Palestinians, that was, and still is, conducting an active genocide against the Palestinian nation. Rather, the opportunist that he was, he viewed it through the lens of the imperialist interests of the United States. 
In his words, quote, we were determined from the beginning to prevent an Arab victory, which we looked at as a Soviet victory. It's quoting Kissinger in September 2023 in an exclusive Jerusalem Post interview. So I don't know how much more we need to hear about you know this guy describing who he is. Kissinger was, in fact, against a ceasefire. Wow, I wonder if anyone else is against a ceasefire in uh, Palestine today. Kissinger was, in fact, against a ceasefire during the Yom Kippur War. The deranged gambler that he was, betting with blood and iron, he was unwilling to allow the war to end while the Zionists were down in material. I think they mean material, but anyway... Uh, in other words, he only opposed the ceasefire to double down in support for the genocidal army of Israel, feeding it tanks, bombs, guns, anti-aircraft weapons, all to double down in support for Israel with the ruthlessness of a mafioso and the bloodlust of a depraved sadist. Somehow the Soviet Union justly sending equipment to the Arab-Palestinian coalition is justification to support a genocidal army. But with criminals like Kissinger, this heartlessness is to be expected. Quote, I was very opposed to reaching a ceasefire while the battle was going in favor of the offensive. We looked at it in part also as the impact on the international system of Soviet armed countries gaining diplomatic benefits from military action. That's, again, that same interview from 2023. Kissinger did not respect the rights of the Palestinians. Rather, he took a dehumanizing view of them. His criticism of Israel did not include the forceful expulsion of Palestinians from Palestine the Israeli annexations of Palestinian land, or the brutality of Israeli settler colonialism. Instead, his contention was that Israel's level of brutality and adventurism would set back Israeli strategic interests. So basically just saying, like, not, not now, guys, you're going to screw up your long game. This is because he sought to isolate the Palestinians from the Arab coalition, divide and conquer. Perhaps Ki Kissinger simply prefers the practical and sensible genocide, so, quoting Kissinger 1981 to isolate the Palestinians, but I have left the Palestinian question alone in order to work on frontier questions, hoping eventually to isolate the Palestinians. And this could work. We could have split the Palestinians from the Syrians for only a few more kilometers on the Golan, but the Israelis insisted on moving the settlements right up to the line. My feeling now is that the Syrians will be driven toward even greater radicalism. Israel must realize that it must deal with the Arab governments if it doesn't want to deal with the Palestinians. But, you know, Israel is a lot like Germany before the First World War in that there is this tendency to produce what it most fears. So he's not opposed to them. He's just saying that they're using bad strategy. During the Yom Kippur War, the United States airlifted 22,318 tons of material to Israel. This included weapons and military equipment, including... 155mm uh, howitzers, 175mm cannons, M60 and M48 battle tanks, Sikorsky CH-53D helicopters, and McDonnell Douglas A4 Skyhawk aircraft fuselages. This airlift undoubtedly played a major role in the Israeli victory over the Palestinian people. Kissinger, with no shame, admitted to playing a major role in the U.S. airlift of these supplies to Israel. To quote Kissinger himself, quote, When it became apparent that the civilian airlift could not be organized as quickly as we had originally thought, I went to Nixon and told him we needed another level of airlift to affect the situation. We needed a military airlift. And then Nixon, in his characteristic way, which was that once the decision was made, he did the full scale of it to the extent that it could be done. He ordered the immediate airlift for the Israelis, and we began a major military airlift on Friday evening and at full scale on Saturday morning. 2023 Jerusalem Post. In summary, Kissinger armed the Israeli occupation army against Palestine, sought to delay a ceasefire in order to strengthen Israel against the Soviet-backed PLO and Arab coalition, and acted opportunistically alongside U.S. imperialist interests in Israel as opposed to justice. Had Kissinger and the Nixon government he represented not intervened in Israel in the way that it did, an Israeli victory could have been prevented. The genocide and colonization of Palestinians could have been ended, and the ongoing Israel-Hamas war in which Israel has murdered 17,400 people plus as of the time of this writing, Palestinians could have been prevented. East Timor. Henry Kissinger, during the years of the Gerald Ford administration, also played a role in greenlighting the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, which resulted in the East Timor genocide and 200,000-plus deaths. 
When Indonesian dictator Suharto, in a 1975 meeting with Kissinger and Ford, asked the United States to build a factory to manufacture M16 rifles for the Indonesian military to use, Kissinger said that, quote, we would favor this as a government because of its indication of wider cooperation. That's quoting the Ford Suharto meeting from December 1975. Kissinger, in fact, knew that the Indonesian government was planning action in East Timor, yet instead of warning the dictator against an invasion of East Timor or declaring a principled U.S. stance against Indonesian aggression. I'm not sure there is such thing. The U.S.'s only principle is literally just more profit as quickly as possible and, uh, you know, to be sustained as long as possible. Um, he, in fact, encouraged the Indonesian dictator with the caveat being that he only wished the dictator to wait until the president returns home on opportunistic grounds so as to manipulate American public opinion more easily in favor of Suharto. Kissinger could have even chosen to say and do nothing, merely ignoring it, but instead he actively encouraged Suharto to act quickly, becoming complicit in Suharto's crimes. See, quote, It is important that whatever you do succeeds quickly, we would be able to influence the reaction in America if whatever happens happens after we return. This way there would be less chance of people talking in an unauthorized way. And, quote, if you have made plans, we will do our best to keep everyone quiet until the president returns home, unquote. As is consistent with Kissinger, he acted in the interests of the big bourgeoisie and private companies. And in few places does he make that as abundantly clear as when he personally spoke with Suharto. See Kissinger here, quote, Our main concern is that whatever you do does not create a climate that discourages investment. That's what it is all about, folks. Basically, the matter is between you and the companies. We are not involved in such problems. Suharto replies, quote, We have taken these views into account, and everything that we will do will be based on existing laws. We want to find a way of obtaining revenue, which will not jeopardize fair profits for companies. Kissinger, we appreciate your clarification of this matter, unquote. Kissinger is a warmongering profiteer, and the highest crimes in all the land, even genocide, is acceptable to him so long as it is in the interests of big business. Had Kissinger objected here, had Kissinger supported the East Timor people, then perhaps the East Timor genocide could have been prevented or alleviated. But no, Kissinger has no qualms with covering for genocide as long as it's in the, in the interests of American imperialism. Argentina. In 1976, there was a military coup in Argentina, which established a dictatorial military junta. The Argentinian dictatorship, in an effort to repress political dissent, murdered or, quote, disappeared 30,000 people. They would keep pregnant prisoners under arrest until they gave birth just to murder the mother and abduct their child. It was a horrible period in Argentina, characterized by political repression and fear. So naturally, of course, it comes as no surprise that Kissinger supported and encouraged the Argentinian government in the conducting of these repressions. At this point, it is hardly surprising, but in 1976, Kissinger blatantly stated to the Argentinian foreign minister that, quote, if there are things that have to be done, you should do them quickly, but you should get back quickly to normal procedures. And, quote, we are aware that you're in a difficult period. It is a curious time when political, criminal, and terrorist activities tend to merge without any clear separation. How convenient. We understand that you must establish authority. This is all from a 1976 Memorandum of Conversation. Kissinger even made it clear that he knew that the government was violating human rights and that the American public would be opposed to the U.S. supporting Argentina. Yet, of course, Kissinger once again makes it clear that he does not care about that when he says, quote, In the United States, we have strong domestic pressures to do something on human rights. We want you to succeed. We do not want to harass you. I'll do what I can. A CIA document transcribing Kissinger's briefing before this meeting shows that Kissinger was aware that Argentina was attempting to use the, quote, Chilean method when he said these things. But considering that Kissinger was an architect behind the Chilean fascist coup against the democratically elected Salvador Allende, it is no surprise that this would be of no concern to him. The innocent people of Argentina are just one more on the long list of the many lives that Kissinger has helped to ruin. Apartheid South Africa and Apartheid Rhodesia. 
In regards to Africa in general, Kissinger had a very typical racist and white supremacist perspective on the continent. For example, here is an excerpt from a conversation between Kissinger and Nixon. Quote, They've been going to put into Roger's speech at the UN some stuff that we want more self-determination in Africa. And I said, absolute nonsense. Nixon replies, more self-determination would mean more nations. Kissinger, that applies. They'll apply that to Mozambique and South Africa. They won't apply it to black and then something unintelligible. Nixon, yeah, goddamn, just think, 42 countries in Africa, 42 countries, that's ridiculous, unquote. Neither Kissinger nor Nixon respected the right of the African peoples to self-determination, which is typical for chauvinists like them. For context, and this is a fact that makes this all the sadder, is that today there are actually 54 United Nations recognized nations in Africa. Nixon and Kissinger, however, didn't seem to think then that these states have a right to exist. After the 1976 Sowoto massacre in which the apartheid South African government murdered 1,102 students and injured over 2,000, Henry Kissinger visited South Africa, becoming the first Secretary of State to do so in three decades. Kissinger also supported South Africa in the Angolan War and even Rhodesia. In a meeting with a South African diplomat, Kissinger demonstrated that he either believed that the apartheid government of South Africa either wasn't racist and reactionary or that he at least wished the government could hide it better. When the diplomat became concerned that Kissinger was seeking South Africa to reform and share power with black Africans, Kissinger outright stated that he was not trying to reform the apartheid government of South Africa into giving political power to the black majority, but rather that he was trying to prevent apartheid South Africa from being forced to face a coalition of 46 African states, the Cubans, North Koreans, and Vietnamese. So, to Kissinger, quote, I have asked my foreign minister to make a statement supporting some elements of your speech and trip. Kissinger, if he could say something which would show that you are not totally reactionary, uh, a totally reactionary racist state. Both, uh, we have never shared power. Smith in the Constitution has. We are for a majority rule, but through separate states. We are for the same goal. Kissinger, we are not trying to reform you. We're trying to prevent the radicalization of black Africa and a race war. We want to avoid your having to face a coalition of 46 African states supported by the Cubans, North Koreans, North Vietnamese, or whatever. 1976. Kissinger, in a report about South Africa, wrote that he wanted to relax political isolation and economic restrictions on white states without openly taking that stance, and that the U.S. government would be flexible in its attitude toward the apartheid Smith regime. Quote, this is Kissinger, the whites are here to stay, and the only way that constructive change can come about is through them. You know, the people causing the repression. And, quote, we would maintain public opposition to racial repression, but relax political isolation and economic restrictions on the white states. We would begin by modest indications of this relaxation, broadening the scope of our relations and contacts gradually, and to some degree in response to tangible, albeit small and gradual, moderation of white policies. So they just want small and gradual moderation of the racist policies without openly taking a position undermining the UK and UN on Rhodesia, we would be more flexible in our attitude toward the Smith regime. And that's quoting from a December 9, 1979 study in response to national security, uh, a national security study memorandum. For those who don't know, Ian Smith was the prime minister of apartheid Rhodesia. And these are the sort of people and governments that Kissinger saw it opportune to relax relations with and be flexible toward scoundrel. Conclusion. There is so much that could be said about Henry Kissinger, much that should be said. What I wrote about in this article only scratches the surface of Kissinger's complete and utter depravity, leaving a trail of bodies wherever he rests his hand, from Cyprus, Chile, Vietnam, Cambodia, East Timor, Argentina, South Africa, to Palestine. The list goes on and on. Kissinger has consistently prioritized the imperialist interest of the American bourgeoisie over democracy and human rights, at every turn. The press about Kissinger, the legendary diplomat, is a great man of history, is a complete lie. Henry Kissinger is no more than an especially rapacious war criminal who ought to serve as an example for what evil is. Kissinger never received punishment for the crimes he committed. Now that he's dead, he never will. His victims will never receive justice. Kissinger was allowed to live to the ripe old age of 100, 
honored by the U.S. government, with his name intact and his back free against the wind. Henry Kissinger is a good example of how in the United States, any crime is acceptable so long as it's done on behalf of the bourgeois government. Because for as much culpability as Kissinger has for his own actions, he was just one cog in the machine of the U.S. bureaucratic military industrial complex, Workers of the World Unite. So thank you very much uh, to the Red Spectre for hosting that and to the author for uh, sharing that link and suggesting it. That was a good article and I appreciate it. I'm sure that a lot of the uh, listeners do as well. We've been going for like two hours already. Um, let's see if we can get through some more of the chat. And I definitely have like a bunch more articles. We'll have to shelve some stuff, I'm sure. But let's keep going. Yeah, the small D pun. I mean, you know what they're saying. There's small D Democrats, like they believe in democracy, but not necessarily the party. But when you go on social media talking about your small D, it's just, it's not going to go over. That's all I'm saying. You know, like it or not, that is not going to go over. Poorly phrased. Yeah, I mean, Grover Fur is somebody um, who did work. Uh, basically, what Grover Fur did, as I heard him explain in an interview, is he took a lot of anti-Stalin biographies and, and, and history books, and he ran down all the citations. And basically, his work focuses on the fact that a lot of the anti-Stalin stuff, if you trace back the citations, they don't actually say all the anti-Stalin stuff that the anti-Stalin historians, you know, writing those narratives say. Um, I, you know, my criticism of Fur is I think sometimes his presentation takes it to a point that goes it almost undermines it because it it comes off as almost kind of raving in a way. Um, no doubt he has done some work exposing that a lot of the anti-Stalin stuff is fictional. It's made up and that the citations that these historians are are showing, um, you know, are, are, are fabricated. So no doubt, I mean, a lot of the anti-Stalin stuff is extremely exaggerated. But I think also as communists, it's incumbent on us to um, take to you know never really accept things that happened as being sort of perfect or you know idyllic um, that we should always engage in rigorous criticism including self-criticism and i think that 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 period you know the uh, such an early period of the first national effort to create a socialist state should be examined with a great deal of scrutiny and heavily criticized. I don't think anybody, you know, I mean, it's like the Mao thing about, you know, Stalin, it was like 70% good, 30% bad. I, mean, I think that's a bit lazy and, you know, rounding off a lot of edges um, that uh, should be gotten into in a lot more detail. But, but that is the point. It's like, well, let's get into them in detail and find out what actually happened because you can uphold Stalin and uphold the USSR as, building socialism while also accepting that not everything worked out perfectly and um you know what what can we learn from that so anyway i've just i've heard some uh you know interviews and speeches from fur where i i don't think that the presentation was likely to be convincing to people who weren't sort of already um really looking for it to be so you know it it, like I said, you you can learn a lot from that, but uh, to some extent, I feel like that needs a somewhat better messenger. So, people also are pointing to iskrabooks.org, Stalin: A History and Critique. Grover Fur, I think, might be guilty of what you'd call overcorrection. He's more contentious amongst academic historians. However, there's little criticism of someone like Robert Conquest or Solzhenitsyn. So, I don't put huge faith in a lot of academic historians regarding the USSR. Yeah, like I said, I feel like he overstates the, like the Stalin literally did nothing wrong thing. No, everybody does stuff wrong, and we need to be realistic about that if we want to be serious communists. So, yeah. Did I get up to anything for April Fool's? I had something planned. Honestly, I was thinking about it for months, and uh, I got involved in something on April 1st. I just completely, it just totally escaped my mind. Totally forgot to do it. Oh, well. Grover Fur is a good study of the archives, but he excuses a lot in caps. That's kind of what I'm saying. I, I feel like he uh, Fur's work is helpful in a very specific way, which is debunking a lot of the kind of more blatant anti-Stalin stuff. Which I mean, if you if you think more critically and skeptically, you'd probably be disinclined to believe 
in the first place and then he goes and shows that hey this was just made up there's actually no source corroborating it i literally tell everyone about this channel well i'm glad you're into it i mean i try to make it as good as i possibly can because this is serious to me so good one thing i know is at least half the views on the debs videos eugene debs are all me it hits so fucking hard yeah i love the eugene debs speeches and especially to hear you know debs referred to himself as an american bolshevik to hear from somebody that was american you know and a real product of like u.s culture per se being so into it it's you know it does kind of speak our language culturally and that was a guy who you know we look at the movement today and we look at quote left political leaders today who you actually want as political leaders and debs ran for president a number of times as a socialist uh you want people coming out of labor struggles and you know you want people who have proven themselves in the proletarian struggle that's who you want because they they're going to have that class consciousness and they've actually proven that they're you know have have those leadership qualities and and re really are that vanguard and uh we don't really have that struggle generating those kinds of leaders today and I hope we get there soon. You know, intensify class struggle. There's a reason. I mean, I, I discussed that in a recent stream. Uh, somebody asked, what does the intensify class struggle uh, slogan mean? It means pretty much what it says. Let's get this thing going. Because sitting back and rolling over for bad conditions doesn't get you anything but more bad conditions. And we're in a race against time, against fascism here. Which, uh, as the, the end of chapter one of that audiobook that we just did uh, by R.P. Dutt, says uh you know we're we're in a race to preserve you know human culture and civilization from encroaching fascism as advanced capitalism breaks down that's what it's going to do and uh you know the environment um species ex you know mass extinction of different species it's well underway you know uh i think that che che guevara although a hero also demonstrated the failure of focoism which ultimately led to his death so yeah, this kind of sounds like somebody was mentioning the uh, the Hoja criticism of of Che's approach as kind of adventurous or disconnected from the masses. But yeah, I don't know if it'll help, but you could try mentioning in the YouTube description and check out the playlist tab. Yeah, I, I sometimes do that if there's a really specific one, but I don't know. I might make some videos on that. I've discussed in the streams that people should check out the playlists more. I also went through a huge amount of effort organizing the playlists and then YouTube like totally collapsed the playlists tab. They used to be better organized. Now they're just organized by date. So I don't know what's going on with that, but yeah. Aside from the horrible U.S. sanctions, I think that the reliance on the revisionist USSR, which didn't help Cuba develop its own industry and economy, but tied its economy to the USSR in a sort of colonial way, well, and incidentally, that's exactly what anti-revisionists like Hoja describe as social imperialism. That the USSR, uh, well, social imperialism had a meaning back to Lenin, which was different. But, uh, you know, it was a name for what Mao and Hoja called the USSR, that it was um, socialist in name, but taking on features of imperialism. Which I think you could describe as they had a socialist revolution and therefore had built socialism however with the reformist revisionist leadership it started slinking back and uh, taking on some of the characteristics of the next highest stage of historical development which is late stage capitalism or imperialism advanced monopoly capitalism so yeah the ussr was building socialism and then it started slipping back into some imperialist type behaviors and that's an example of it Anyway, we'll, we'll read some other examples of USSR behaving like that, which Hoja was very vocally complaining about. Cuba and its Neighbors by Arnold August. Oh yeah, we'll do potatoes for sure in Cooking with S4A. Yeah, you so, okay, so talking about forage foods before, um, roadside foods might be contaminated by road salt, runoff, etc. Yeah, do not, if you do get into foraging, I mean, the first piece of advice any you know, authority on foraging is going to give you is stay at least a hundred feet away from a road. <laughs> I'm just saying that Queen Anne's Lace grows alongside roads. Like it's very easy to see. It's very common. Um, and it is one of the quote weeds 
that takes over an area um, easily and starts cultivating the soil. Like there's a whole um, process of development where smaller plants that spread more readily take over an area and they start prepping the soil and then bigger plants like shrubs can kind of move in and eventually trees and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, no, don't, don't eat stuff that's growing next to a road for sure. So you can find Queen Anne's lace that is not growing next to a road. Just a lot of it does, uh, you know, grow in kind of any open sunny area. It's very common to see it. I absolutely hate Anarch. I've argued with him on his claims about history multiple times. He always ghosts me when I get at him with decent historical resources. Lamau, Anarch is such a baby brain. He looks more interested in his beard and shirts. Wait, are you saying an anarchist is more concerned with like superficial aesthetics than about like the substance of their politics? What? Just looked up Anarch, lol. He describes himself as anarchist and libertarian socialist. What does that even mean? Uh... I mean, you can go back to Marx and Engels talking about utopian socialism and anarchism. and Like, anarchism was not new in Marx and Engels' time. They criticized Bakunin, Proudhon, you know, various anarchists. Can the capitalist state save itself from collapse for all infinity? No, it cannot. This is actually um, a thing that is discussed. No, capitalism trends toward, as the rate of profit drops, as, as it tends to do, uh, it trends toward greater and greater instability. And as uh, Dutt talks about in Fascism and Social Revolution uh, throughout the work, the emergence of fascism was a sign that capitalism was becoming more and more desperate, that its crises would become more and more violent until, you know, just completely disrupting every facet of life. Who says it's not going to be for the next 1,000 years? So go to the community tab. I posted a link to some studies on the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Current studies, like from the last few years, on the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um, it, it has been in secular decline for quite a while. And somebody asked actually in the comments, what happens if it reaches zero? It's not going to reach zero because there's going to be enormous social upheavals before then. You will either get a socialist revolution and civilization will continue uh, or you will get Mad Max, which is, you know, incidentally, uh, the, what the anarcho-capitalists or crypto-fascists want. As Dutt explains in Fascism and Social Revolution, as capitalism advances into its extreme crisis states, it's just basically an open war with itself. Fascism is an attempt to just manage civil war as, as the contradictions and conflicts uh, and just disruptions of capitalism come into just sharper and sharper and sharper relief decade after decade. Fascism is just a system of trying to manage them while the bourgeoisie squeeze every last drop of profit that they can get, which gets harder and harder for them to do. So they have to use more and more extreme methods of exploitation. Simultaneously, mass, mass unemployment emerges, and then you get genocides to kill off the, quote, surplus labor etc etc it's not a good scene we have to end this the anarchists in the spanish civil war established a state by anarch's definition and yet anarch still upholds it same for Machnovia, and he just denies it you can't have a secret police and not have apparatuses of the state regardless of if it you know the flag is all black or not People that call themselves libertarian socialists are just anarchists that don't want to sound like they're in high school. Yeah. I mean, back before I overcame my anti-communism, I mean, I had an ANCOM phase. It ended, as I've described many times before, when I started going, how do anarchists take power? And I realized there was no answer to that question. And if, if anyone is ever to take power... Uh, it basically, you know, that was when I decided to go back to Marxism because, which I had been introduced to long ago and just never studied properly. And then I was like, uh, okay, well, I guess it's time to pick up that Marx again, even though everybody's like, communism is dead, it's over. I'm like, well, I mean, we still got to do something about capitalism and anarchism isn't really cutting it. So Hoja's reflections on China was a huge two volume work. 
But uh, he was criticizing the Communist Party of China long before Mao died. Yeah. Kissinger being a good friend of China is the nail in the coffin for multipolarity bros. China is the leader of the multipolar world. It's revisionism. Yeah. I mean, we'll get, we're going to be getting into that. I'm going to do some anti-Dugan stuff shortly. And uh, let me just say it's not going to... The, the pro-Dugan people are not going to come out looking too good. All you got to do is read Dugan's stuff. It's like... <laughs> I actually started reading some Dugan. Somebody showed me some Dugan. I was like, holy shit, he said that? <laughs> like, it's so blatant. It's so fascist. Uh, yeah. And the idea that it's in any way Marxist at all is like... Just flies in the face of every word he ever wrote. Image rehabilitation is a lucrative industry. George W. Bush is just a goofy old grandpa who likes to paint. Well, I mean, they were doing that with him in the beginning. This sort of pseudo folksy. He's a guy you'd like to have a beer with. Okay, is he running for uh, president of guys to have a beer with? No. He's fucking running for president of the United States. So, I mean, use appropriate standards. But Richard Helms is a ghoul. Political satire became obsolete when Henry Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Tom Lehrer, absolutely. Uh, those peace negotiations went so famously well. How anyone still thinks of the Nobel Peace Prize being anything but the ultimate ironic euphemism is amazing. Uh, I have skimmed little bits of Settlers. Um, I haven't read it yet, but yeah, that would hold, hold some significance for the socialist movement. For sure. Uh, Charmander says, I love foraging mushrooms. So you got to be really careful uh, foraging mushrooms because there tend to be way more dangerous poisonous mushrooms than there are plants. And it's like they're harder to tell apart. So like there's plenty of uh, forageable plants that do not have dangerous lookalikes. Or, you know, there's... Uh, yeah, no, that's, that statement's accurate. There are plenty of plants that you can focus on that really don't have a lot of dangerous lookalikes. Or there are easy ways to tell the lookalikes apart. Mushrooms, unless you're like really a studied mycologist, I would still I would stay away from. I've only picked uh, mushrooms like rarely, r very rarely. Uh, I'm yeah, Anyway, so just be careful with mushrooms. I saw a thumbnail for one of Anarch's videos titled Why the State is Counter-Revolutionary. Yeah, that's that series I was talking about. Yeah. All right, we are caught up with the chat, so let's get into, drumroll, today's content. I wish I had a little, like, animation and sound effect for that, but I don't. So what were we going to do? COVID. Um, I'm going to just do a quick Biobot update. And we're going to save the COVID articles on, until the next stream because I have like a ton of other stuff I want to get to. And uh, nobody listens to the COVID stuff anyway. Anyway, COVID is not over. You can see on the screen we're coming out of one of the biggest waves of COVID, far bigger than what we had in 2020 or 2021, uh, right up really to the end of 2021 when Omicron broke out. But basically, you know, a very sizable hump of COVID there. And also regionally, it is starting to come down now, finally. But let me emphasize, and I'll put up the year-over-year uh, -year view here just so that you can see this. Uh, up at the top there is the year-over-year -year view. The red line is this year. This is um, an unusually high late winter and early spring. So we're having like a very late, uh, not really surge because it's on the way down, but we had an extended surge late into the winter, and now we're even in early spring. So the COVID patterns are shifting somewhat, but I mean, overall, they're just kind of growing. And again, they are finally starting to come back down into what would be a more normal range for this time of year. But it's taken a really unusually long time uh, for us to get there. All right, so COVID's not over. Mask up. I mean... I know it's a pain, but, you know, you got to do it. Let's look at one thing quickly. Uh, I did have some longer COVID articles that I will um, push to later. But here's uh, from Nature Human Behavior, uh, open access, published 21st of March, 2024. 
long-term risk of psychiatric disorder and psychotropic prescription after a SARS coronavirus 2 infection among the UK general population. So what did they say? I mean, we already know that there is a link between getting COVID and it doing brain damage. It can uh, infect your brain, cause inflammation in your brain. Here's the abstract. Despite evidence indicating increased risk of psychiatric issues among COVID-19 survivors, questions persist about long-term mental health outcomes and the protective effect of vaccination. So they describe some of the things here. Uh, and compared with contemporary controls, infected participants had higher subsequent risks of incident mental health at one year. And so you can see the hazard ratio or odds ratio there is 1.54. That's a really significant um, you know, elevation in your odds. Difference in incidence rate, 27.36, uh, and uh, including the psychotic mood, anxiety, alcohol use and sleep disorders, and prescriptions for antipsychotics, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, mood stabilizers, and opioids. Risks were higher for hospitalized individuals, and you can see there that uh, it's 2.17, so more than double the odds there uh, if you were hospitalized, which is something we see if your infection was severe enough that you got hospitalized, it tends to do a lot more damage in your body. You're way more likely to get long COVID, which in this case includes psychiatric issues. And I don't know about you, but living in this society, you know, I have plenty of mental stress and, you know, kind of uh, emotional pain and everything else. I don't need any more risk of developing a psychiatric, you know, mental health issue. But SARS coronavirus 2, if it infects you, definitely will do that. Like I said, compared with contemporary controls, so controls from today under the same general social conditions. If you're infected, you have higher odds of psychotic mood, anxiety, alcohol use and sleep disorders, and prescriptions for antipsychotics, antidepressants, benzos, mood stabilizers, and opioids. Okay, so uh, the risks were higher for hospitalized individuals than those not hospitalized. And so even people who you know got COVID and weren't hospitalized still had a higher risk of mental health disorders like this, but the hospitalized ones were even higher. Um, and then they were reduced in fully vaccinated people. Isn't that interesting? And you can see there that uh, it's 0.97, which technically is below the baseline, below the controls. However, what you see right after that is the range is 0.8 to 0.119. So when it crosses one like that, it means that um, it's basically the same. You can't tell if it was more or less. But in, in all the other cases, it was definitely elevated. So basically, um, the uh, fully vaccinated people had the same risk as, as other people. So if you're not up to date on, on the vaccines, uh, you know, do that, especially if you haven't gotten any. So anyway, as they say, fully vaccinated people uh, had basically the same odds as, as the general population compared with non-vaccinated or partially vaccinated individuals. Breakthrough infections showed a similar risk of psychiatric diagnosis, but increased prescription risk. So uh, there, getting a diagnosis was, you know, comparable to a control, but uh, there was increased risk, 42% of uh, being prescribed something for, you know, psychiatric medication compared with uninfected controls. Early identification and treatment of psychiatric disorders in COVID-19 survivors, especially those severely affected or unvaccinated, should be a priority in the management of long COVID. This is something to be on the lookout for. With the accumulation of breakthrough infections in the, quote, post-pandemic era, again, refer back to that biobot chart where not, I mean, we're out of the point where people are, like, dying in the streets so much, but, like, we're definitely not it's still a pandemic and it's still mutating and spreading globally, basically unrestrained. So that's, that's a pandemic. Um, remember endemic is confined to a region. Uh, no pandemic is uncontained global transmission. That's what we have. Um, the findings highlight the need for continued optimization of strategies to foster resilience and prevent escalation of subclinical mental health symptoms, all the way up to severe mental health disorders. So, I mean, the risk just getting fully vaccinated is going to reduce 
your risks uh, down to basically baseline. So that alone in this case for, for this particular risk is, is going to take care of a lot of it. Uh, masking also, you know, is going to prevent you from getting infected at all. But in this case, looks like the vaccines actually really are significantly helpful. All right. And then just a, an article from The Guardian here. Quote, alarming rise in Americans with long COVID symptoms. Some 6.8% of American adults are currently experiencing long COVID symptoms. And that doesn't include people who had it, but aren't experiencing it anymore. That's just like at any one time. According to a new survey from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, or the U.S. Centers for Disease, they don't, in my opinion, do that much on the control and prevention side, revealing a, quote, alarming increase in recent months, even as the health agency uh, relaxes COVID isolation recommendations, not just relaxes, but completely eliminates them. So yeah, the CDC, I mean, anything involving them at this point, they've been downplaying COVID so badly. I mean, I don't even know what to say. Another thing that I think is worth uh, mentioning here, and maybe we can come back and do this whole article later. I think this is from Vox. Uh, Ultraviolet light can kill almost all the viruses in a room. Why isn't it everywhere? Can special light bulbs end the next pandemic before it starts? This is from January by Dylan Matthews. And I guess just uh, skipping to the end, this was actually a pretty lengthy article. Let's at least read the conclusion. A report from One Day Sooner and the research group Rethink Priorities estimates that outfitting a room roughly 750 square feet in area with far UV lamps currently costs between $2,500 and $5,000 depending on the shape of the space. So it's a pretty decent sized room, 10 by 75, but that's also pretty expensive. Now, I definitely have been in like concert venues that, uh, you know, they have the filters up on the walls and they do have UV light. So some places are doing this. I, you know, I've seen it in some places out in public, but I mean, this is something that the government, if they actually work for people and they don't, they're a capitalist government, for the rich, everything having to do with our well-being is just basically an expense. And so they want to spend as little as possible on us. Um, you know, this is something if we had a socialist government that was, you know, of and for workers, we could get this kind of stuff going and actually protect public health. But uh, yeah, anyway, that doesn't include the cost of additional filtration to account for any ozone effect. But it's much more cost effective in terms of disinfection per dollar than using ventilation and filtration systems alone, which is an idea that has gained currency since the COVID pandemic began. And while increased ventilation brings significant energy costs, the energy usage of UV lamps is minimal. So it doesn't use much energy to get a lot more bang for your buck out of existing ventilation and filtration uh, systems. So they've estimated here in this report that far UV, upper room UV and ventilation filtration in every single commercial building in the U.S., would require a one-off investment of $214 billion. And that's doable. I mean, there's so many things that are doable. You know, we could do anything. We have uh, very, very productive technology, a lot of people willing to work, but all of the profit, you know, most of the, the products of labor just go to buying private islands and planes and yachts and whatever else, you know, mansions for uh, the extremely wealthy. You know, and just uh, going into them making investments in our further exploitation down the line. We need to end the system and we need, there's so much that is possible now that they don't even want you thinking about. That was one thing, you know, Bernie Sanders was an opportunist and a sheepdog and a faker that ultimately picked up the left and then dropped it on its head later on. But in that brief period where people were rallying by the stadiums full, people really were thinking about what was possible and wow we could really do this we could actually get a country that doesn't just suck shit 24 7 and we need people thinking like that again and craving it and struggling for it and then we will eventually get that opportunity we'll get to build up the strength and we'll get a window of opportunity and we will fight through and end the system that's what we got to do and this is just one example of how much more we could be doing all right, I'll leave it there um, on the COVID for now, and uh, I had a longer article I'll, I'll do later. So kind of another interesting thing, while we're talking about um, health-related topics, 
There was something somebody mentioned to me about how smartphones cause anxiety, and I thought that that was interesting because it does seem to me like anxiety is skyrocketing. It's, I mean, one of the most common um, mental health diagnoses around the world. And, you know, is the is the technology of, like, always-on Internet connections being in everybody's pocket, is that contributing to it somehow? I think it's contributing the access to all the information, and obviously we're doing the stream on the Internet right now, there is a lot of benefits to that, but also is the way that it's being done actually making people kind of suffer, you know? So anyway, this is um, a study from Computers in Human Behavior from 2014. So kind of close to this beginning of the smartphone era, you know, the flip phone to smartphone changeover. Uh, then, of course, you have like Blackberries before that. But uh, out of sight is not out of mind. The impact of restricting wireless mobile device use on anxiety levels among low, moderate, and high wireless mobile device users. Highlights. We examined anxiety when wireless mobile devices were unexpectedly not available. So, you know, somebody thinks they rely on their phone. Uh, what happens when it's not there to their anxiety? Participants felt significantly more anxious over time. Heavy wireless mobile device users were more anxious than low or moderate users. Wireless mobile device dependency may cause anxiety when the device is absent. I mean, this is like definitely like leaning toward addiction type behavior. Uh, heavy wireless mobile device users may feel separation anxiety when the device is absent. So kind of actually starting to sound uh, like a, a relationship. The abstract says that the overuse of wireless mobile devices, which conveniently abbreviates to WMDs, may be associated with a form of psychological dependency of which a prominent feature may be anxiety arising from separation from these devices. I can't wait to hear the comments on this because, again, the study's from 10 years ago. This has been known for a while, and I think a lot of people have this problem. College students who are among the most avid consumers of WMDs might be susceptible to the negative effects of WMD overuse. The present study examined anxiety in American college students when their WMDs were unexpectedly not available upon arrival. And let me just say, if I had written the study, I would just be laughing. I'd wake up in the morning laughing about that WMDs thing. That is awesome. Um, upon arrival, Approximately one half of the 163 participants in the study were randomly assigned to have their WMDs removed from their possession. The other half was allowed to keep their WMDs, but were required to turn them off and place them out of sight. Participants were forced to sit quietly with no distractions during the study. The state portion of the State Trait Anxiety Inventory, STAI, or it's like a psychological test for um, determining levels of anxiety, was administered three times, 20 minutes apart, beginning 10 minutes after the participants entered the room. The results showed that participants felt significantly more anxious over time. However, this pattern was evident only with heavy WMD users and with moderate WMD users whose devices were taken away. Dependency upon WMDs, mediated by an unhealthy connection to their constant use, may lead to increased anxiety when the device is absent. So I got another thing here. This is from Journal of Computer Mediated Communication. The study is from January 2015. So same basic time people working in this field were really interested and curious about the effects of this technology which was emerging. So this study is called the Extended Eye Self, the Impact of Phone Separation on Cognition, Emotion, and Physiology. So that last study was focusing on anxiety. This one also branches into cognition and physiology. So the abstract says, this study uniquely examined the effects on self, cognition, anxiety, and physiology when iPhone users are unable to answer their iPhone while performing cognitive tasks. A two-by-two two within subjects experiment was conducted. 40 participants, iPhone users, completed two word search puzzles. So that was the cognitive task, a word search. Among the key findings from this study were that when iPhone users were unable to answer their ringing iPhone during a word search puzzle, heart rate and blood pressure increased, self-reported feelings of anxiety and unpleasantness increased, and self-reported extended self and cognition decreased. These findings suggest that negative psychological and physiological outcomes are associated with iPhone separation and the inability to answer one's ringing iPhone 
during cognitive tasks. Implications of these findings are discussed. So they go on. There's actually an article about this at phys.org and uh, came out like right around the same time. Headline, iPhone separation linked to physiological anxiety and poor cognitive performance study finds. So let's read a little bit more. Cell phone use has become a common part of life as mobile devices have become one of the most popular ways to communicate. Even so, very little research exists on the impact of cell phone usage and specifically what happens when people are separated from their phones. Now, research from the University of Missouri has found the, the show me state. Well, show me. Okay, that was terrible. Has found that cell phone separation can have serious psychological and physiological effects on iPhone users, including poor performance on cognitive tests. The researchers say that these findings suggest that iPhone users should avoid parting with their phones during daily situations that involve a great deal of attention, such as taking tests, sitting in conferences or meetings, or completing important work assignments, as it could result in poorer cognitive performance on those tasks. Quote, our findings suggest that iPhone separation can negatively impact performance on mental tasks. Russell Clayton, a doctoral candidate at the MU School of Journalism and lead author of the study, said, quote, Additionally, the results from our study suggest that iPhones are capable of becoming an extension of ourselves, such that when separated, we experience a lessening of self and a negative psychological state. Is anyone feeling uh, called out and attacked here yet? Clayton, along with Glenn Leshner, former professor at MU, now at the University of Oklahoma, and Anthony Almond, doctoral student at Indiana U University Bloomington, found that when iPhone users are unable to answer their ringing phones while solving simple word search puzzles, their heart rate and blood pressure levels increased, uh, which is what we were just reading uh, before. And also their performance, the number of words found, decreased as compared to when iPhone users completed similar word search puzzles while in possession. So they were so distracted, they were they performed p more poorly on the word search. So for the study, they asked the iPhone users to sit at a computer cubicle at a media psychology lab. Um, to me, this is just like, what, what are the implications? Do device detox. Like you've got to uh, reclaim that sense of self. This is hugely impairing. Anyway. So they asked people to sit at a computer cubicle in a media psychology lab. The researchers told the participants that the purpose of the experiment was to test the reliability of a new wireless blood pressure cuff. Participants completed the first word search puzzle with their iPhone in possession and the second one without or vice versa. And then the research uh, researchers monitored their heart rates and their blood pressure levels. And here's the end. While completing the first puzzle, the researchers recorded participants' heart rate and blood pressure responses. Participants then reported their levels of anxiety and how unpleasant or pleasant they felt during the word search puzzle. Next, and while in possession of their iPhones, participants were informed that their iPhones were causing Bluetooth interference with the wireless blood pressure cuff and that they needed to be placed further away in the room. That's really funny. The researchers then provided the participants a second word search puzzle. While working on the puzzle, the researchers called the participants' iPhones. <laughs> I love this. After the phones finished ringing, uh, researchers collected blood pressure and heart rate responses. Participants then reported their levels of anxiety and how unpleasant or pleasant they felt during the word search puzzle. The researchers found a significant increase in anxiety, heart rate, and blood pressure levels, and a significant decrease in puzzle performance when the participants were separated from their iPhones as compared to when iPhone users completed similar word search puzzles while in possession of their iPhones. So there are actually a lot of studies on this kind of topic. And if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to look up like anxiety, iPhone and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, like people talking about device detoxes because I do this and, you know, I try to keep that stuff separate from my sense of self let's put it that way um and i think that has a huge benefit and any time that like you know doesn't happen so often but like you know if i lose power for example or like don't have access to the internet for a while um it's actually really relieving <laughs> i find i mean you got to get back on you got to do the work you got to keep in touch with people and you got to keep up to date with current events and that's that's a lot of this oh i'm missing out 
thing that seems to be driving so much crazy behavior right now. But uh, in a way, when you just let it all go and you have that excuse of like, well, I can't, I couldn't do it if I wanted to. Uh, and you give yourself that, you know, you let yourself, uh, you give yourself that excuse. What am I trying to say? You give yourself that permission. It's like this huge relief. And then you remember, it's like 15 years ago, there just weren't these norms. There weren't these expectations. Anyway, I'm kind of interested in seeing uh, what the chat has to say about this. All right, so going back up to the uh, the COVID stuff. Yeah, Obama got a, a Nobel Peace Prize just for not being Bush. I mean, it was, it was like in the first year or two, yeah. The effects of lead poisoning in boomers and Gen X was generally ignored. I'd assume that it will be like that with COVID, too. Yeah, and microplastics now. The only thing that might affect that is if so much of the excess labor force is killed off that they're going to have to consider acquiescing to workers' demands. That is the point at which it might become a real issue worth fixing in their minds. I think that gets into a lot of complicated side issues that, let's just say, I think it's complicated. Uh, would the UV not increase the risk of skin cancer? So there are different grades of UV light. And also, this is also like putting UV light inside the filter, so it's not necessarily like shining out onto people. Because yes, the kind of UV devices that are used to like disinfect hospital surfaces are pretty intense, but they're different. There's like UVC, there's different grades of it. But if you put it inside the filter where the air is getting sucked through, that's I think all you really need to do. I get freaked out when I can't find my $800 Samsung Galaxy. I mean, part of that, and it's like, uh, you know, I watch like uh, fail compilations sometimes. I don't like the violent ones, but sometimes it's just fun to watch people like goofing around. And the amount of people like dropping their phones off of bridges or whatever, like drop the, I don't know why, this is like an entire subgenre of fail videos, is people eating in Asian restaurants where you have like the, uh, the frying um, container like in the middle of the table and uh, people like dropping their phone like frying their phone literally frying it in oil um, it's crazy like what people do with their phones or even just there's like an entire subgenre of fail videos of people opening the fucking box and it falls out and it's just like oh my god you shouldn't have and people are filming it because they're like get, you know giving somebody a birthday present or something they're like wow I'm, 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 I'm very own fo and it just splats on the ground and cracks the screen and you're just like apple must know that that is happening what is going on but yeah i mean it's like you're carrying around it's like carrying around like a thousand dollar bill in your pocket um that's pretty risky i mean you know you're bringing that out where a lot of wear and tear or the other thing of people dropping their phones out of windows or they're on a boat and it falls overboard like it happens so it happens enough that there's many many videos about it but I mean, obviously, that's, you know, kind of uh, worrying about the value of it. But it's I think this speaks more to just the being connected, you know, and being able to, like, have that second brain, because it really does turn into like a second when they talk about it being an extension of the self. It's like a second brain to people. You know, and we were talking about this with AI as well for people who, you know, are like more average, below average intellect, like using AI, it's like having that smart friend you never had. And it's probably going to come up with ideas you never would have thought of yourself. And yeah, obviously it's like, it like literally is like a second brain. It's giving you ideas you're just not getting on your own. And, you know, even for, for anyone, no, no matter what your sort of, uh, you know, level of intellect is like, you're, you just have access to information there that is, you know, super incredibly useful. You know, it's like having memory banks that are just outside of your, you know, the, the gray matter inside the skull there. The best thing I did recently was turn off all my notifications. Also, when I get home, I put my phone on the counter in the kitchen and leave it there. There you go. It, you know, put it in a box, like, and then, you know, just do what you're doing. I end up checking my stuff when I decide, not when it Pavlov's me. Yeah, when the bell's going off and doing whatever the equivalent of a uh, salivation is. It's a tool, and for those of us who grew up without it, we can give it up partially or fully. It may be different for those who grew up with it, with having smartphones and iPads everywhere. This is like in schools where they use like iPads as rewards and stuff like that. I mean, the kids kind of go crazy over them. It's unhealthy. 
Uh, I also wonder if earlier studies were done on earlier telecommunication devices. There had to be anxiety about leaving the house while waiting for a call. I mean, not real, not that I recall, because the norm was that you might not be home and somebody has to leave a message on the answering machine. You know what I mean? It wasn't this expectation of like things being always on. You know, I lived through the 80s and the 90s and all that. Like people just had answering machines. Some people didn't even have answering machines. You know what I mean? But like you could just get an answering machine and then, you know, you come you go out to eat, you go shopping, whatever, you come back and uh, you check your messages, you know, and maybe you have messages, maybe you don't. But uh, it, there wasn't the expectation that people would be available at all times and just constantly updating themselves and just gorging themselves on information and contacts. I think that is where the anxiety comes from myself is like you just that's what, when people are like thoughts on this. Did you see this? And sometimes it's the intro to something really interesting, but it's like, huh, I don't know. What did I miss? You know what I mean? Like, um, don't get me wrong. Like, I love my people trying to keep me updated on stuff, but it's like, after a while, it's like, no, I haven't seen it. Am I a bad person? You know, it's, it's it kind of freaks you out. It can get to you. So, yeah. I love watching people throw their phones into the ocean. It's amazing. Uh, also, let me just put in a word. has nothing to do with this, but VR fails. I don't know what it is. People put on those headsets and they've completely forgotten they're standing in their living room and hilarity ensues. But like, really, it's just like, is your memory 10 seconds long? Because <laughs> they just started. And the next thing you know, they're like running headfirst into their television set. It's bizarre. Anyway. I grew up in the landline days, and the problem back then was meeting up with people. Couldn't cancel or give updates via text. Yeah, but it was like, that was just the, uh, that was just the, the way it was. You know what I mean? It was like, you, you'd make backup plans for exactly that reason. So yeah, everybody's sharing their favorite type of fail videos now. All right, let's go on. So, so we've discussed the phones and, you know, the sort of ways that this is uh, warping people's minds. So let's talk about doom spending. So this is from British Vogue. What exactly is doom spending? And how do I stop myself doing it? It's by Emily Chan from uh, about six weeks ago, February 14, Valentine's Day. Hey, uh, treat yourself right on Valentine's Day. Stop doom spending. So here's the article. We're all familiar with doom scrolling, but what about doom spending? Okay, it's a phenomenon that's afflicting millennials and Gen Zers who are... Un oh, I don't think it's just millennials and Gen Zers. I think there's a lot of older people that are just as susceptible to this as, as anybody. Uh, in fact, I know a boomer that used to, like, uh, spend all their money on fucking eBay. But this was, like, back, back in the dial-up days. So, yeah, anyway. Um, who are unsurprisingly overwhelmed by the multiple world crises that we're currently facing. In many ways, it's similar to the more familiar concept of retail therapy. You know, you buy stuff, make, your feel be make yourself feel better. Uh, and, th and then eventually you, you gear up to, you, you get to the decluttering stage. I've done too much retail therapy, now I need decluttering therapy anyway. Although the fears that we're trying to quell are arguably of a much greater scale than in the past. And I think people, you know, whether you're talking about uh, you watched too much news about Israel-Palestine or... You have family there or, you know, climate change or whatever. Anyway, yeah, there's huge extinction level news to be worrying about now. Quote, when we buy something, our brain releases feel good hormones like dopamine and endorphins. Iona Bain, founder of Youngish Money and the author of Own It, tells Vogue, quote, shopping has always been an easy, low effort way to self-soothe. And our consumer economy has long been predicated on making us believe that new purchases will lift our spirits and solve our problems. Why is doom spending on the rise? Nowadays, though, the rise of smartphones and social media, along with buy now, pay later schemes, which that was a huge thing over the holidays this year, as people have run out of the pandemic money and they're putting more and more things on credit. Actually, like we said before, consumer credit levels hitting all times, uh, all time highs. Uh, makes it an even more dangerous habit to get into, particularly considering that 43% of millennials and 35% of Gen Z are now doom spending, according to a survey 
by the Credit Karma website. Quote, young people have always been susceptible to overspending because they struggle with peer pressure and identity formation, but they are now more vulnerable to commercial forces than ever because of the dire economic situation that they find themselves in, Bain explains. All too often, I've seen young people get into debt that blights their credit score, weighs them down mentally, and stops them from living full lives, unquote. And, you know, sometimes people do this because of, you know, thoughtless doom spending or like compulsive doom spending, but also people are racking up debt just trying to keep up with basic necessities, which is another issue. But buying new clothes is perhaps one of the most common ways that young people are doom spending. But if we're trying to numb ourselves from fears like the looming climate crisis, isn't it counterintuitive to continue purchasing new things? I mean, again, I think this is just the extent of coping. Sometimes people don't know what else to do. They never learn those skills. After all, isn't that what got us here in the first place? It's a paradox explored by sustainability strategist Alec Leach in his aptly titled book, The World is on Fire, But We're Still Buying Shoes. Quote, fashion is an optimistic undertaking, he writes. It gives us the chance to envision new futures for ourselves, places where our current fears and burdens melt away. Considering that saving to buy a house feels so out of reach for so many millennials and Gen Zers, investing in luxury items, clearly still a privilege, is also a way of taking back a sense, however false, of control. Quote, doom spending is a display of what we call the passive to active flip, with the passive being the many things we may want to change in the world, but feel we cannot change, and the active being the buying of things, Dr. Dion Terlong, otherwise known as the fashion psychologist, explains. Of course, doom spending is never going to solve our problems, which is why so many people get trapped in an unhealthy cycle of constantly buying in search of instant gratification. Quote, if buying things truly made us whole, then we'd have stopped by now, Leach says. But because consumerism doesn't really satisfy our needs, we go around and around chasing trends, sleepwalking into regret purchases again and again. How to stop doom spending. So they do some things here. Um, they give some suggestions. Keep a spending diary. Set boundaries with your phone, which is, you can see why I did these uh, two articles back to back. Have a list of decoy activities. So free activities that can make you feel better instead. Like going for a walk, going for a run, taking a bath, calling a friend, do some yoga, write. Anyway, anything that takes you out of the buying zone. So yeah, you also might want to identify your top five priorities in your life. So like for me outside of work, they say it's healthy eating, exercise, rest, connection, and creativity. I try to make sure that all five are factored into my daily life, and that helps to take me away from mindless spending. And uh, also start saving little by little. I'm not even going to get into that because there's a lot of uh, complicated things about that. I mean, I think the even the best money management... I mean, it's not an excuse to, like, just squander your money, but even people who are very careful are still struggling. So, you know, but there, I guess there's levels of struggling. Like, you can struggle with $10,000 in the bank account. Like, you can have your six-month emergency fund or whatever. Or you can struggle without having it. But even trying to save that, you know, your ten dollars or $20,000 where you could survive a six-month emergency, um, that's super difficult today. But if you're interested in uh, decoy activities... You can find this online. They're actually fairly commonplace in kind of health and wellness and psychology websites of like lists of pleasurable activities that, you know, are free and uh, are attainable for, for a lot of people that you can do instead of spending your money on stuff. Uh, engage in altruistic behavior is the last suggestion. So instead of doom spending, try investing in your community instead. You know, join a uh, Vanguard study group, for example. Now, let me say a lot of the activities that are put out there as activism may or may not be super effective. So you want to be critical about what you're investing in uh, as far as time wise for your activities. Do things that really are you know, going to have some kind of tangible effect because there's a lot of stuff that um, may or, you know, I think is designed to kind of eat up people's time without necessarily you know, building anything or leading to real change. So there, there can be some, uh, some decoys there too. All right. So it's speaking of the economy and spending money and everything else, let's talk about what is going on with the probably looming economic crisis in the next year or two. So we've been talking about this, uh, on and off for some time now. 
And we'll get right into it. This is from the AP. The Federal Reserve still foresees three interest rate cuts this year, despite a bump in inflation. We can read this article. This is, as I was saying in the intro, kind of a crazy subject to me because um, the market investors, capitalists really, really desperately are used to the previous 10 years or so, which was a very low interest rate environment. You could borrow money at like less than 1% interest or less than 2% interest. And as the saying goes, anything is a viable business model at 1% interest when they start bumping it up and it becomes more expensive to take on debt, the price of money goes up basically. And you're trying to refinance at like seven or 8% when your debt comes up for, you know, it expires and you have to uh, renew it. Uh, a lot of businesses are not necessarily going to be able to do that. So they're desperate for the Fed to lower the interest rate so that they can get money more cheaply. And the, what's the problem? is that this long period of low interest rates has created a huge amount of inflation. And I mean, it's a significant factor in inflation. It's not the only factor. But um, so you've got the inflation getting out of control and they're trying to tame it down to the arbitrary 2% inflation level, which there's absolutely nothing like <laughs> scientific about the 2% inflation rate. It was just literally like, Somebody said, well, we should get inflation to 1%. I think it was an Australian authority. And somebody else was like, yeah, well, I don't know, maybe 2%. And that was about it. So anyway, they settled on 2% inflation or 2% price growth from year to year. You know, this is not prices ever falling, which they absolutely need to do. That would be deflation. But they're just like, well, we need to slow down the rate of inflation to 2%. That's, that's their target. They think that that is sustainable. It's really not prices have to come down they can't just keep going up from here even at a two percent rate but anyway um the inflation is not under control yet and yet they're already talking about caving to the demands of investors to lower the interest rate and we've talked about i i did a big video on this before um and actually let me go ahead and put this on the screen now there we go this is um total assets, uh, you can see what the banking system, the financial system has been doing in terms of quantitative easing and putting assets on the Fed's balance sheet. This is pretty much unprecedented on this level, but it's how they solved the problem of the 2008 global financial crisis, is they started dumping lots and lots of money there, and also having higher requirements of uh, keeping reserves for financial institutions and things like that. But it's gotten out of control. Every time that they try to bring it back down again, there's a financial major hiccup, let's say. And the only way that they can cure it, you know, it's like that uh, fever, it's only got one cure, more cowbell. This fever has only one cure, more quantitative easing. As soon as they try to do tightening, there's some event. Like you can see, uh, after a long period of the first three rounds of QE, in 2018 into 2019, they started backing off. And what happened? There was the repo madness event in late 2019 where the liquidity dried up and there was almost a major seizure of the financial system. Well, they eased their way back out of that. Then the pandemic hit and they did QE4, dumping huge amounts of money into the system that peaked around 2022. Then they went back into quantitative tightening. But as they tightened, as they started pulling the money out of the system, what happened? Well, one year ago, you had the SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, and the Signature Bank crisis and like Credit Suisse. And so you started having an event. And this happens like every time they just pull like 7 or 8% of the money they had eased into the system. Well, after they tighten it back out, 7 or 8%, there's some kind of major event. So we've been in a tight, and then so look, how did they solve that? They took on those bad assets. Now they've been trying to tighten their way back out, and they're talking about doing quantitative easing again. But they're on the verge of risking hyperinflation at this point, like where things just cost, you know, I mean, you hear the old stories about situations of hyperinflation, like, uh, 
you know, it costs like a wheelbarrow full of currency to like buy a loaf of bread. I mean, we're obviously not at that point, but prices are getting out of control. And uh, definitely like housing is completely unaffordable. The median house price in the U.S. is over $400,000. You have to be making over $100,000 a year to be able to afford that. And that's, you know, like 90 percent, like you have to be at the 90th uh, percentile for income to afford a house, to afford the median house. So that's the situation that we're in. Of course, food is crazy expensive and so on. So going back to this, they are actually talking right now about um, cutting rates. And what they seem to be risking is the situation in the 70s where they cut rates too soon and inflation went way back up again. And it led to, it was just part of a larger crisis um, for the capitalist system in the 1970s, which was fixed in the 80s with Reaganism, Thatcherism, neoliberalism. So, where in which they pushed the cost of the crisis onto workers. All right. So this is by Christopher Rugaber, Rugaber, I don't know. If I, that was my name, I'd say Rugaber. But um, yeah, March 20, 2024, AP. Federal Reserve officials signaled Wednesday, so this is a couple weeks ago, that they still expect to cut their key interest rate three times in 2024. And this fueled a rally on Wall Street, despite signs that inflation remained elevated at the start of the year. For now, the officials kept their benchmark rate unchanged for a fifth straight time. Now, keep in mind, they haven't cut anything yet. They're just saying that they expect to cut later, although there's some indications that they're less certain about that than they used to be. But they are still generally planning on it, okay? But how did Wall Street respond? They responded like they've already cut rates already. And it's so, anyway. Also, you need to kind of worry when they cut rates because usually when they've cut rates, that means that they've done the damage and start initiated a recession. So it's not actually like good news because what they're trying to do is cause economic contraction. And why would they want economic contraction? Like, don't you want the economy to just grow? Well, we've been talking about this in the fascism and social revolution audiobook that we just started recently. And no, capitalism, and this goes all the way back, you can read it in Principles of Communism, you can read it in the Manifesto of the Communist Party. It's been observed for a long time that capitalism has this 10-year cycle or the boom and bust cycle, which is overproduction crises. It means that too much stuff gets produced and production has to shut down for a while, economic activity has to contract, so that the extra commodity, the extra goods that have been produced can be consumed. And then when scarcity has been reestablished, then production can resume. And so this is the boom and bust cycle. It's overproduction crises that have to be remedied by destruction of capital by, by one way or another. And in socialism, actually, you would not only not have this, but you would increase production dramatically beyond what capitalism, even in its best times, would do. Not only would you avoid the bust part of capitalism, but you would push way beyond where the boom is way bigger than it is in capitalism because capitalism emerges during a time, feudalism, of natural scarcity. Capitalism then introduces huge productive forces that make it possible for you know a few million people to do the work of what used to take like a billion people before. And so huge, huge productive forces, natural scarcity is basically overcome. And then to protect profits and prices, capitalism has to artificially, by destroying capital and, and this whole cycle, they have to maintain uh, artificial scarcity, basically. So this is one of the main ways that capitalism is holding back progress. Yes, it had a progressive role earlier over feudalism, but now it is literally holding us back and threatening to destroy all of human civilization and the environment and cause mass extinction and so on. Anyway, speaking at a news conference, Chair Jerome Powell said that the surprising pickup in inflation in January and February hadn't fundamentally changed the Fed's picture of the economy. The central bank still expects inf inflation to continue to cool, though more gradually than it thought three months ago. So it's changing its picture of that. Meanwhile, there's other economies that are going into flat-out recession, like Japan, the UK, Germany, Finland. And so it's like, well, there's a risk here that the U.S., they, they might do too much and the U.S. unexpectedly slips into a huge recession, 
but anyway, it's just, it's so wild to me reading this stuff. It's like the people running the system don't even seem to know how it works. So anyway, the recent high inflation readings followed six months of steady slowdowns in price increases. Economists and Wall Street investors were looking for some more clarification Wednesday about how the latest inflation reports were viewed at the Fed. The January and February data, Powell said, quote, haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road toward 2%, which is the Fed's target, is for prices to increase 2% per year. Not to drop, but to increase, but only at that rate. In new quarterly projections that they issued, the policymakers forecast that stronger growth in inflation above their 2% target level would persist into next year. Overall, the forecasts suggest that the Fed still expects an unusual combination, a healthy job market and economy in tandem with inflation that continues to cool just more gradually than they had predicted three months ago. So this is the soft landing or no landing scenario where they get things back under control and there's no you know, devastating disruption of society because of the economy. Good luck with that. They always predict it. It's rarely ever how it turns out. It turns out not that way, way more often than not. For this year, the Fed projected that the economy will expand 2.1%, a big increase from its December forecast of just 1.4%. Yet at the same time, it's still, I mean, that's, yeah, 50% higher. Yet at the same time, it still expects inflation to keep declining, though slowly. Michael Gapin, chief U.S. economist at Bank of America, said that the Fed's updated projections suggest that it expects improvement in supply chains and availability of workers to continue, allowing the economy to grow even as inflation slows to the Fed's target. So they say, like, availability of workers and supply chains. They're talking about the pandemic disruption, shutdowns, workers being sick en masse and things like that. They're expecting that, like, that will be overcome. Well, we'll see. Rising immigration, for example, has made it easier for businesses to hire without having to rapidly raise pay. Quote, it looks to me like they're embracing that supply side story, Gapin said. That means you can cut while growth is solid and you can cut while the labor market is strong. Rate cuts would, over time, lead to lower costs for home and auto loans, credit card borrowing, and business loans. They might also aid President Joe Biden's re-election bid, which is facing widespread public unhappiness, or a 38% approval rating, over higher prices and could benefit from an economic jolt stemming from lower borrowing rates. Um, This goes on like a little bit. You can see a chart of inflation there. The financial markets cheered this message that they'll be cutting, and it's like inflation has come down. The cuts are just around the corner, and the market's like cut now. And he's like, no, 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 we're not going to cut now. I mean, it, I think he might kind of just be saying this, but we'll definitely see. And so it says the Fed's policymakers did make some small adjustment in their outlook. Their projections showed that in 2025, they now foresee only three rate cuts, down from the four they had earlier envisioned. One reason may be that they expect core inflation, which excludes volatile food and energy costs, to still be 2.6% by the end of 2024, which is up from their previous projection of Uh, 2.4 rather than 2.6. In January, core inflation was 2.8, according to the Fed's preferred measure. Oh, wow, we got a weird, uh, that's really strange. There's like a totally incomplete paragraph right there. So another interesting thing that I'd like to mention here is that Powell has been on record addressing the housing market. Um, Just seeing if there's anything in here about that. I mean, they're talking about there's signs that the economy could weaken in the coming months. I think that that's likely. There's also another, they mentioned the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has reached 3.9%, still a healthy level. Again, you don't need unemployment in socialism, but you need it in capitalism. So that's another thing we could overcome by ending capitalism is unemployment. Uh, But up from a half century low last year of 3.4%. Thing you need to understand about unemployment is when it goes up, it tends to go up rapidly. It spikes. And this is another um, feature about the sort of stuck onset of the recession that we seem to be facing. So businesses seem to be very reluctant to, uh, even though like manufacturing numbers are going down, 
like economic indicators are going down, yet they're not translating into layoffs. Why? Employers seem to right now be very reluctant to start laying people off, which that's one of the clearest and most obvious signs of a recession. It's in like most definitions of recession, like the top four indicators is uh, unemployment going up. And but it hasn't yet in the U.S. And a lot of it may be related to in 2022 and so on, when businesses were having kind of a hard time hiring people. They want to keep the workers that they have now, even if there is an economic downturn and, you know, business starts slowing. They don't want to lose the workers and then not be able to hire them back later. And that's one explanation for why, even though there's a lot of economic indicators going south, one of the key ones that would formally sign signify a recession, uh, unemployment, hasn't hasn't been moving yet. But, you know, there could be something eventually as businesses say, well, we're just losing too much money. I'd like to hold on to my workers, but we can't anymore. But they haven't they don't seem to have reached that point yet so much. Anyway, other major central banks are also keeping rates high to ensure that they have a firm handle on consumer price spikes in Europe. Pressure is building to lower borrowing costs as inflation drops and economic growth stalls. And what's the next thing? Recession, which again, prices are insane. Recession would bring the prices down. But a lot of the people in the system, a lot of the capitalists right now, they're, I think, subconsciously like terrified of another 2008. And they're trying to forestall. They're like, no, 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 keep interest rates low forever. We need to just keep everything afloat no matter how kind of much of a distortion it is. And they really, really fear the next event because, you know, as we were showing before on that housing chart, which is like a decent proxy in general, um, as we talk about more and more violent economic events as capitalism goes on, this is that housing prices adjusted for inflation over 130 years. I would call that definitely more and more violent fluctuations in prices that could you know, disrupt an entire society. They want to keep it high forever. They're, and no, it wants to come back down to the 130 year average. That's just what things do in capitalism. They eventually come back down to the average that it takes to produce stuff. But again, the instability, the gigantic fluctuations, they're trying to tell this story and, and tell themselves and go on believing that, no, it can just stay high forever. It doesn't have to come back down. And that's that why they're begging for these rate cuts, but it will. And I think it's going to do another, you know, 2008 when it does. So another story on this Reuters feds. Powell says that balance sheet drawdown taper is coming soon. So this is from about the same time, two weeks ago. And uh, this was crazy to me because I'm like, they're thinking about doing QE again. Like they're going to get rid of the quantitative tightening and start putting money back in or, or just level it out. So what does it say? Washington, March 20, the Federal Reserve is nearing a decision on slowing the pace of its balance sheet runoff. That's quantitative tightening. Central Bank Chair Jerome Powell said on Wednesday, a tapering move that may allow it to shed more bonds than it had uh, once expected. Powell's remarks, the most explicit so far about plans to slow a process that has seen about $1.4 trillion of bonds roll off the Fed's balance sheet was seen by several Wall Street analysts as a signal that a tapering plan will be unveiled as early as the Fed's next meeting on April 30 to May 1st. Quote, it will be appropriate to, or I've attempted to do a Powell impression, it'll be appropriate to slow the pace of runoff fairly soon. That wasn't a very good Powell, but he has this remarkable like text-to-speech voice. Anyway, said at a press conference following a federal open market committee meeting, he did not offer a specific time frame for the decision, saying only that officials are now debating the issue, whether to taper. Powell was addressing the central bank's ongoing efforts to reduce the size of its holdings, commonly referred to as quantitative tightening or QT. Officials aggressively increased the central bank's balance sheet as part of the response to the coronavirus pandemic. Starting in the spring of 2020, the Fed bought treasury and mortgage bonds in great numbers, first to stabilize financial markets and then to provide stimulus when the Fed's interest rate target was at near zero levels and could be cut no further. So, in other words, what happened was they, they were giving away money that could be borrowed at 0% interest, basically. They couldn't cut the rate anymore because 
Otherwise, they'd be paying people to take loans out if you had a negative interest rate. So what did they start doing? They just started doing stimulus. Like, well, they basically did start hand handing out free money or paying people to just exist. Um, that quantitative easing or QE caused Fed holdings to more than double, topping out at $9 trillion by the summer of 2022. This is the chart we were looking at before. The Fed began to shrink the size of its holdings later that year, having embarked in March 2022 on what would be a robust campaign of interest rate increases aimed at bringing high levels of inflation back to its 2% target. And again, that 2% target is like totally arbitrary as we discussed. So there's a chart, the evolution of the Fed's balance sheet, eyeing an end game for quantitative tightening. So this is the balance sheet size in dollars of how much the Federal Reserve is holding. But what do you notice? It starts in 2020, making the whole thing look kind of normal. But if we go back to the chart that I was showing before, which shows it on a longer time scale. Yeah, so the 2020 part is just to the right of that rightmost gray line. If you go back, like, historically, prior to 2008 and that whole crisis, it was uh, a much lower number. It was historically always under $1 trillion. And then what do we see? Are we seeing, like, a breakdown crisis of capitalism and the world financial system here? They've never had to revert to this tactic before, and it's looking pretty serious there. Anyway, going back to uh, what we had on the screen before, since the fall of 2022, the Fed has been allowing up to $60 billion per month in treasuries and $35 billion per month in mortgage bonds to expire and not be replaced. So in other words, those have expiration dates, and once they go, they are not uh, replacing them with new, new ones. So overall, the balance is going down. The Fed is seeking to reduce the size of its holdings in a way that will ensure, note that confident language, ensure the financial system has enough liquidity or cash for the Fed to retain firm control over the federal funds rate, its chief tool to influence the economy's momentum and to allow for normal levels of volatility in money market rates. To achieve that, Fed officials have been signaling for some time that they would first lay out a plan to slow or taper the pace of quantitative tightening, given uncertainty over how far they'll need to shrink their overall holdings. But again, think back to that long-term chart. Where do they need to shrink it back to? Well, historically, it was always under $1 trillion. But now, what what is special about this current period, other than that it's, you know, they're clinging to dear life, uh, after the 2008 to 2010, like global financial crash, like what is fundamentally different where suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, eight trillion or seven trillion. It's somewhere in there. Well, why is it there now? And up to 2008, up to like 15 years ago, it was always under one trillion. Like wh why? And so and why can't you seem to get it back down again with major, major without major things breaking in the system? These are questions that they don't really want <laughs> asked or they don't have very good answers to. Uh, to me, it seems like a breakdown crisis of the system as it's reaching um, its, its global limits and its, and its end of life limits. But anyway, officials are mindful of the events of September 2019. That was repo madness when the uh, repurchase markets started to like seize up and go crazy. When a QT effort then in play, that was 2018 to 2019, they were starting to pull some of that money out of the system, unexpectedly drew too much liquidity out of the financial system. Although, again, it was like 7 or 8% of what they had pumped in. <laughs> causing which Again, why was the system able to run without that before, but now taking 7 or 8% out causes another global economic meltdown? Riddle me this. Like, seriously... Um, th that is the question the system, I think, doesn't really want to answer. Anyway, causing significant interest rate churn, requiring the Fed to add liquidity back by once again expanding its balance sheet. And that's exactly what we saw on that. It, there's a little bump at the end of 2019, and then it spikes because of the pandemic. Thomas Simons, economist at investment bank Jefferies, said in a note that Powell's comments may have moved forward the start of the tapering process. Quote, we had been thinking that the tapering of quantitative tightening would begin in June or July, but this guidance suggests that perhaps the announcement could come sooner, 
possibly the next meeting on May 1st, he wrote. Simon's view was echoed by others, quote, we now expect that the Fed may make this announcement as early as the May FOMC meeting, ahead of our previous expectation of a June announcement. Tiffany Wilding, managing director and economist at PIMCO, said in a note. In his press conference, Powell said that slowing the drawdown from its current pace may allow the central bank to compress the size of its holdings by a greater degree. Quote, we may actually be able to get to a lower level because we would avoid the kind of frictions that might happen by shedding bonds too quickly, he said. Powell noted the end game for Fed holdings envisions a level of banking sector liquidity large enough to navigate normal volatility and periods of stress. But he cautioned that there's no easy rule of thumb for stopping QT, saying, quote, there's not a dollar amount or percent of GDP or anything like that to look to. Why? This is a brand new technique that they started using like 15 years ago. Japan started using it a little bit earlier. Um, you know, there was... Prior to 2008, there was the dot-com bubble and the crash of, like, 2001. I believe that Japan started using uh, QE back then, and then it was more widely adopted at, globally after 2008. So, yeah, there's not a dollar amount or percent of GDP. Basically, they're going to start taking stuff out, but things could break at any time because they really don't know how dire the situation is, and this is kind of just a thing that they just made up. Um, yeah, there's no real theory to it other than just... Get some money back in there so the system doesn't seize up. That's it. That, that's the only thing behind it. Just sheer panic, basically. Ahead of the FOMC meeting, a bare majority of economists in a Reuters poll had been expecting the QT taper process to begin in June and wrap up early next year. So, um, but again, wrap up early next year to what end? Like, what point of this graph are we going back to? Are we going back to pre-pandemic levels in a year and a half? That would involve cutting this by, like, in half. Is that even possible without the entire system just drying up like a raisin? I sincerely doubt it. So what are they considering the new normal for this? And how long will it last before another crisis breaks out anyway? Is there anything that they can do? I feel like we're, we're at the end of uh, the old 60s Batman. It's like, will the Cape Crusader be able to escape the... The Joker's, you know, buzzsaw. I mean, it really, it's like this cliffhanger thing of like, we're living through a gigantic crisis and nobody knows what the fuck is going to happen as far as 2008, the underlying issues of 2008, rearing its head again. So I got one more article for you here about this crisis, and that will end our economy section for uh, this stream. But here's an article from The Conversation, why economists are warning of another U.S banking crisis and this is from uh, a little over a month ago and that's jay powell himself there uh <laughs> the man with the beautiful monotone march 2024 is making investors nervous a major scheme to prop up the u.s banking system is ending they're talking about the btfp we talked about this in the last stream while a second may be winding down some economic commentators fear another banking crisis so how worried should we be the red letter day is March 11, when U.S. Central Bank, Federal Reserve, will end the Bank Term Funding Program, BTFP, a year after it began in response to the failures of regional banks, Signature, Silvergate, and Silicon Valley. These banks were brought down by customers withdrawing deposits en masse, what's called a bank run, both because many were tech or crypto businesses that needed money to recover losses and because there were better savings rates available elsewhere. This is another thing for people who have bought into the thing that um, housing prices are going to stay high forever. No, when investors who bought that housing and are sitting on like empty rentals can get better return on investment elsewhere, they will dump those properties and they will go own a piece of paper instead if it gives them a better, you know, uh, return on their investment. Like if, if you have a rental property that you know, you wind up because of how much you had to buy it for and the interest rate on the loan, on the mortgage, and then the prevailing rent rental rate. If And, you know, then you got to actually maintain that. You got to hire somebody to mow the grass and, like, paint the exterior and, and all that kind of stuff. You got to manage the property. If that's only getting you 4%, but you can go buy a piece of paper that will get you 5%, believe me, they're not going to hang on to the building for that long. So, you know, that's going to happen too, something to keep in mind. 
This damaged the bank's profitability at a time when raised interest rates had already weakened their balance sheets by reducing the value of their holdings in government bonds. Silvergate failed first, but Silicon Valley Bank's collapse on March 10 was particularly memorable. It triggered a bank run by announcing that it needed to raise capital after being forced to sell bonds at a loss. There soon followed the failures of Signature and also Swiss Bank Credit Suisse, which had to be taken over by neighboring giant UBS. There had been long-standing problems at Credit Suisse, but heightened anxieties on the bank of the U.S. upheaval delivered the final blow. How the BTFP works. Investors then feared that other banks would fail. Most U.S. banks were similarly exposed to customer withdrawals and underwater bond portfolios, while the Credit Suisse collapse demonstrated the potential for contagion. So contagion is when it escapes one institution and starts affecting other ones because they do have investments in other institutions. If that goes down, it can sometimes take down other institutions. The Fed's BTFP stopped the panic by allowing U.S. banks to borrow from the central bank using their bonds as collateral. Not only did this let them quietly access more funding, the scheme also priced the bonds at their original face value, not market value. So... (laughs) I don't know what to say. <laughs> this effectively negated the interest rate rises and reinflated banks' balance sheets. Only one more bank, San Francisco's First Republic Bank, has since gone under. I mean, it's only been a year, but... And the amount of assets involved in that was also, although the number of institutions was small, the amount of assets was, like, comparable to what was, you know, starting back in the 08 bubble, so... Uh, What will happen as the BTFP closes? I suspect it won't lead to more bank collapses. Banks have had another year to adjust to higher interest rates, plus they can still borrow from the Fed through another facility called the discount window, although they don't like going to that because it doesn't look good. Nonetheless, the BTFP's closure is likely to increase banks' borrowing costs, meaning that their profit margins will fall. They might react with higher lending rates, or by making credit less available to customers, so making it harder to take out loans or more expensive to take out loans, which is also a way of making it harder, but also just qualifying for the loan will be more difficult, which can potentially weaken the economy, you think? Uh, This could combine with a second foreseeable change to create new dangers for the sector. Absolutely. So nobody really knows where this is going, but everybody can see the risk quantitative tightening. This is what we were just talking about. That second change relates to the quantitative easing program by the Fed and other central banks, which broadly dates from the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. It saw central banks essentially creating new money and using it to buy government bonds and other financial assets. They added more reserves to high street banks as part of this process, enabling these institutions to lend more money as a result. The most recent leg of QE began in March 2020 in response to the pandemic, then ended in 2022 when central banks began a reverse program called quantitative tightening. This involves selling bonds and other assets and removing the proceeds from the financial system. It should be a drag on the economy, yet the effects have been tempered by a facility known as the Overnight Reverse Repurchase Agreement, or Overnight Reverse Repo. This essentially enables financial institutions to deposit their excess cash overnight with their central bank in exchange for government bonds. They earn extra money at a very low risk, injecting more liquidity into the system. So this is those markets where the repo madness happened. That was uh, where that started. There's the reverse repo and the regular repo. The facility was extremely popular during the period of QE and ultra low interest rates because these injected so much cash into the system. Its use has been falling since late 2022, since central banks have fewer bonds to lend, while institutions have less money to park overnight. This is actually a big thing. You can find videos on this topic itself um, about the amount of money that on average is going into the repo markets um, dwindling over time. And when that dries up entirely, which it probably should in the next few months, there could be another liquidity crisis again. The balances at the Fed's overnight reverse repo have fallen, this is what I was talking about, from over uh, $2 trillion U.S. dollars in mid-2023 to below $600 billion in January. So that's 
significant drop. However, while the positive continues, it offsets the need for the Fed to remove bank reserves as part of QT, since the bonds flowing out under that scheme are being partially replaced by bonds flowing in through overnight reverse repo. And a pop-up covered part of this, but only when the reverse repo balance reaches very low levels will the system feel the full effect of QT. So that's the explanation for what we were just reading. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, they're ending quantitative tightening again. It's This is why, because that liquidity is drying up again. And so they're going to back off the quantitative tightening because they don't want another SVB signature bank crisis. So that that's what they're trying to do is like, as this money in the reverse repo market dwindles, they need to back off and give that some space to breathe. So, I mean, they're getting a little bit more savvy about the predicament that they're in, but, you know, it's like, will something else just break instead? Risky times, and this is the end of the article, heightened interest rates have already led to the most stringent credit standards and weakest loan demand from consumers and businesses in a long time in the U.S. Meanwhile, banks are dealing with other major challenges, such as the plunge in demand for office space as a result of home working. This has brought the medium-sized New York Community Bank to the brink in recent weeks. I think I had a community post about that. For instance, the closure of the BTFP at the and the end of the reverse repo buffer, when that dries up, particularly if they coincide, could clearly make banks even more risk-averse and profit-hungry. The danger is that this all damages the economy to the point that bad debts pile up and we hit another 2008-style liquidity crisis where banks become wary of lending to one another and the weaker ones can't get that credit and they become unviable. The recent geopolitical tensions are an additional danger. If cross-border credit and investments dried up, it might further increase the risks of bad debts and could again hit bond prices, further reducing the value of banks' assets and making their borrowing more expensive. They're on such thin ice here. I just literally am getting like a, a tightrope walker image in my mind. The Fed and other central banks need to be alert to these rising risks. Ice is getting thin here. And get ready to end QT in the near future. The end of the BTFP is unlikely to put banks out of business. And in fact, it has been almost a month and nothing major has gone up in flames yet. But it could be one of a series of blows that kicks off a new crisis in the months ahead. So in other words, the reverse repo uh, liquidity, that was one buffer. The BTFP, that's another buffer. As the buffers start to disappear and you're just left with kind of a no guardrail situation, you could get real banged up. So they mentioned the geopolitical stuff. And actually, I have a couple articles. We've been streaming like for a real long time now. I want to get into this. Um... We're probably not going to get to a lot of the Israel stuff today. As I said, that was a little bit older anyway. We discussed some of it in the Kissinger thing. Um, that will go into probably the next stream. But I wanted to mention this. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of videos about France and Ukraine. And France, uh, basically in their national security strategy in 2022, started talking about um, you know maybe sending troops directly to Ukraine, where French troops could be shooting directly at Russian troops. So this is from uh, just yesterday you, uh, in the Guardian, Ukraine war briefing. Russia warns France against deploying troops to Ukraine. Russian defense minister has first phone call with French counterparts since 2022. What we know on day 771. And again, every time I see that, I just think of the, uh, you know, how the U.S. said they're going to like march into uh Iraq would be over in like 10 days. They'd be, you know, be greeted as liberators. Yeah, no. Um, so some of the main things here, Russia's defense minister warned his French counterpart against deploying troops to Ukraine in a rare phone call on Wednesday, reports the AP. Sergei Shoigu told French defense minister Sebastien Le Cornu that if Paris follows up on its statements about the possibility of sending a French military contingent to Ukraine, quote, it will create problems for France itself, according to a statement from the Russian defense ministry. It didn't elaborate. French President Emmanuel Macron said in February that the possibility of Western troops being sent to Ukraine couldn't be ruled out. French officials have since clarified that the suggestion concerned using troops for training and other operations 
away from the front lines. Now, the UK has been doing that for some time, but they do it in the UK. They ship the Ukrainian troops to the UK for training, then they ship them back. But now they're talking about doing more on the ground there. And that's at least according to France. France has denied Russia's claim of a discussion on potential Ukraine talks, according to Agence France Presse. Russia said that Shoigu and Le Cornu discussed the potential for talks on the Ukraine conflict during the phone call this Wednesday, but it's a claim that Paris immediately denied. Quote, France neither accepted nor proposed anything of the sort on the conflict, the source told AFP. So this article kind of goes along with a lot of bullet points, but I want to get into another one. This is from Al Jazeera from a slightly different angle. What's behind Macron's hardened stance on the Russia-Ukraine war? If you're interested in this topic, there's been a lot, like I said, popping up in the last week or two about it. Let's just skip ahead to the conclusion here. They say that excluding exceptions such as Hungary and Slovakia, countries in Eastern and Central Europe are the, quote, most vocal and supportive of Ukraine and have, quote, warmly welcomed Macron's shift uh, Macron's shift seemed to start at the end of May last year, so almost in effect for a year, when he was speaking at a security conference hosted by Globsec, a Bratislava-based think tank. In a speech, he acknowledged that Paris had failed to sufficiently listen to the concerns of NATO members more geographically closer to Russia and Ukraine. Quote, he certainly realized that if he wants to build a stronger Europe and a more strategically autonomous Europe, meaning strategically autonomous from the USA, as he usually says, he needs these countries, and this is certainly a way to reconcile the two hemispheres of Europe. So that may be, you know, the article had a few other things about it, but that was one of the hypotheses that they're putting out there, is that Macron is basically, as people get sick of the US for various reasons in Europe, uh, could France be like the new leader of Europe in, in, a, in a way that the US kind of used to be, but in a more European style, for lack of a better word. So this is possibly overtures towards, uh, you know, making friends throughout Eastern Europe and having them look to France as a leader. So a political ploy to get support for French leadership in general within the EU. So that was uh, some of the hypothesis there. I did also want to just super briefly, because people are always going on about I mean, I say people, I mean like LaRouches and the multipolarity people are often going on about, you know, how Russia is like socialist or they're on the road to socialism. No, they're not. <laughs> there was a counter-revolution 30 years ago. What they're doing has nothing to do with socialism uh, whatsoever. They're a, an imperialist power that is less entrenched and less established than NATO. They're vying for a bigger cut in the redivision of the world imperialist system. They want more profits. They want what any advanced monopoly capitalist power wants. I think this is particularly striking when you look at some of the recruitment ads and the strategies that they're using. So this is a few months old, and um, some of you may have seen this already. This is from another channel, and what's my timestamp here? Uh, 1145. So some Russia, Russian military ad stuff. This is from another channel that actually does like super skewed coverage. They never criticize it's the channel's Joe Blogs. They never do critical coverage of the U.S. or the U.K. or anything like that. Everything's like Russia, China, this and that. Um, and it's, I think, reasonable criticism and, uh, you know, good as far as it is. The guy, like, literally, it's so one-sided, it's kind of ridiculous. That said, I mean... In the one side that they do, it's, it's I think, reasonable uh, a fair amount of the time. I'm not like a... I wouldn't necessarily promote the channel, but I check out a thing or two from time to time because they do cover stuff about the Russian economy that gets into the nitty-gritty or the Chinese economy. that gets into the nitty-gritty that um, just isn't covered a lot of other places. But let me bring this up here. And... Uh, let me just uh, so this was uh, from the from the video there. I'll skip ahead. They they have some footage of the recruitment ads, and it is kind of uh, not what we would call a particularly like class conscious approach. It's definitely more kind of fascist, uh, I would say in its approach. But here, can I pull that? No, I can't. All right, let's go ahead and play it. Hopefully, the volume doesn't like. Brace yourself.
Okay, so what do we have here in a nutshell? You've got join the Russian military because society is giving you shitty jobs that make you miserable. Or uh, you're super in debt and the only way that you can get out is to join the military. Otherwise, like, mobsters are going to kill you. <laughs> or, you you know, grandpa has to sell his car uh, unless you go sell your body on the front lines for, you know, Russian national interests. Tell me how this is different from, like, literally any other country. It's like these the, the appeals to the, like, machismo. And uh, this, is, this is the solution to poverty. So, again, so much for uh, socialism there. But I guess, I don't know, I guess I'm an ultra. So what can I tell you? But I, I did want to share that. All right, so we are done with uh, basically the stuff I pulled. And again, I did have some articles on Israel. I want to share one thing as kind of a teaser for next time, and I'll include this. Um, I want to get back into AI stuff because I did find some more interesting. We were talking about AI a lot last spring and summer. And... Um, there is a thing I'll just tease now for next time, which is this. Um, it's from Salon. Experts alarmed over AI in military. We talked about autonomous weapon systems before. Here's an example of that. As Gaza turns into a testing ground for U.S.-made war robots. So this is where they're actually testing those kind of general dynamics um, robot dog type things. That's what's in the picture. Of course, it's painted camouflage. So uh, this and more coming in the next S4A stream. All right, so let's get back into the chat now, and then we will wrap up for today. What do we got? Somebody saying three-hour stream? I'd see one better, four-hour stream. Uh, one house phone shared by everyone. You just went over to knock on people's doors more. Yeah, that was definitely how the, the landline days worked, for sure. Yeah, it was called, like, living in reality, not just, like, everything mediated by electronics and the internet. If doom spending wasn't a thing before the younger generations, then Alex Jones wouldn't have been able to terrify his audience into buying brain pills and supplements and doomsday prepper meals. For sure. I mean, and definitely he was a pioneer in that field. Baths are underrated. There you go. Uh, definitely a pleasurable activity you'll find on, on that list. And very low cost, just the cost of your hot water. Uh, once a week I light a joint, mix a Manhattan, and soak for an hour. I mean, don't <laughs> don't drown. But, um, you know, I mean, you can definitely take the bath uh, substance-free as well. Uh, it does wonders for the brain and physical relaxation. I feel like I'm going to be put on a list for watching this stream. List of cool kids... Archimedes invented pie in the bathtub. Another shout out for bathtubs being uh, good relaxing places that let your brain unwind. Are you sure that wasn't uh, Archimedes, uh, the displacement principle of like uh, calculating volume? But anyway, Argentina is in the piles of bills phase now. Yeah. Contracted economies are dollar signs in the eyes of investors in some industries. Yeah, because they get to buy up assets cheap. Speaking of the crisis of overproduction, can't wait for your capital audiobook. Yeah, coming relatively soon. We got some long stuff to get through, but it's definitely coming up soon. I uh, was trying to get a greater understanding of the labor theory of value. Coming up. Yeah, I linked to Andrew S. Reitenberg. He did all three volumes of capital. If you want to get to it now, I mean, when I do it, I will be, you know, helping to break it down, but... If you just want to hear it as an audiobook, Reitenberg has it, and I, I, I do link to him on the channel. Gosh, suddenly I feel like my life lacks any purpose because I'm not enlisted in the Russian armed forces. I mean, do you feel, A, challenges to your masculinity, B, hounded by debt collectors, or C, watching your elderly relatives sell off their personal belongings? I have a way to fix all that. Zionists should test those bots on themselves. The more AI bots keep popping up on social media, the more I think about the dead internet theory. Also, the Kessler effect is kind of depressing to think about. I actually don't really know either of those, so homework for me. Have I heard about Israel using an AI program called Lavender to pick targets to bomb? This wipes their hands free of responsibility for making decisions. because They can just blame it on AI. Horrible. I haven't heard of that. Maybe we'll cover that in that next stream in that section. Uh, but... Uh, 
what I have seen is every time, like, they they say that the, the Israeli military, first of all, can't commit atrocities because everything is checked in a long chain of command involving lawyers and all this stuff. But then, like, when they inevitably do get shown to be doing things at a systematic, you know, in a systematic way, at every level of the military, they're committing atrocities. It's like they have some new excuse for it. So they have real issues with that accountability thing. I think AI probably will help them out a lot uh, with that, that whole accountability thing. Dead internet theory is basically that the internet will become overrun with AI bots trying to promote and sell things to each other and will become unusable for actual people. Well, this is what I was saying uh, back in uh, like April, May, when we started talking about it, was that when um, generative AI can make video and audio that's indistinguishable from, uh, you know, people, let alone text um, from like human generated stuff, the Internet will be unusable because it'll be impossible to tell what's a scam, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, I think that that is unless it is kept off somehow. I think that is rapidly approaching, actually. The Kessler effect is basically compounding arguments of space junk, making orbit impossible without damage. Interesting. <laughs> Boomers already can't tell the difference between AI and reality. Yeah, I mean, there was a video I was watching. We'll get into this more in the next stream. But, you know, somebody talking about it's it's been, uh, you know, only a year since the Will Smith eating spaghetti video and already the video has like come so much further. So boomers wouldn't be able to tell between an Edward Bernays ad, Edward Bernays ad campaign and a news piece. Yeah. So they were, they're already fooled by a much less sophisticated technology for sure. And for the record, I do have Edward Bernays propaganda in, in the hopper somewhere. I have no idea where I'll actually uh, end up reading it, but we're going to call it there. And that was a uh, solid four-hour stream, for sure. And uh, I'm going to hate myself later when I have to edit this. But thanks to everybody who showed up to help contribute to the stream and make it what it is. Thanks to the patrons and Buy Me A Coffee supporters, again, for giving me the time to be able to spend on this. And the more we get, as far as the contributions, the more hours per month I can spend. I do actually kind of look at that at the beginning of the month and go... And I keep a timesheet now, so I'm like, all right, how many hours can I really put in this month and actually, you know, kind of get paid for it? Um, so, you know, we're getting more efficient here at S4A. First it was, you know, thumbnails and <laughs> and logos, and uh, we're, get, we're getting efficient. But I think it's just going to get better and better. So patreon.com slash socialism for all. Buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. Really, again, appreciate everybody. Uh who drops in on the streams, who comes into the YouTube later, who DMs with uh, various, you know, links and articles and questions. It all helps to inform what we do and helps to make this better and makes us all more intelligent. So keep up that struggle and agitate, educate, organize. We'll see you in the next video.